Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ken Jontak. I mean Pontac. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Perfect. Ken Pontac. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. Um, maybe we should explain that Jontak thing. <laughs> um, so, since I'm in a position for people to write things about me, um, I've had things written about me for a really long time. And I noticed that every single article that was ever written has at least one mistake, generally two, and often they're fraught with mistakes. Even though I tell them the facts, the facts get skewed. Um, and then I thought, well, then I asked a bunch of my friends in the industry, has this happened to you? Every single one says, oh yeah. And that got me thinking, okay, if it's everything in my industry, then it's probably everything in every other industry. And it's probably stuff on the news, and it's probably, oh shit, medical textbooks, and <laughs> stuff about operating on brains and how to build airplanes. And then I just stopped thinking about it because it's terrifying. So I had this discussion earlier with Goose, and um, he playfully got my name wrong. It is John Tack, not Pontac. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm finally the only one to get it right. Your birth certificate <laughs> is wrong. That's not the one you want to have wrong either. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've gotten that wrong, too. Often it's Pontiac. They put the I in there because they're lazy. Well, that's when you're trying to be luxurious. Actually, it's Pontiac of the Pontiac Empire. Oh, God, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because you mentioned that, that everybody gets things wrong about you. Just from the short interaction we had before. So, uh, me and... Is it okay if I call you Ken? You you may indeed, yeah. Uh, all right, good. Because I didn't know if you go by another pseudonym if you're on the run. Who knows in this day and age? <laughs> oh, I have... I have many middle names. Um, one of them given to me by a Gumby employee. It was my favorite one. Uh, Ken, mommy, look at me now, Pontac. <laughs> I've also been called Ken doesn't know the meaning of moderation, Pontac. Ken, see, want, get, Pontac. And Ken, id, motivated, Pontac. These all, these all sound like nicknames that you get after a meeting with HR. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Are we there? Wait, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. How okay. many times have you said on the internet? <laughs> so uh, anyway, well, that's always great when, when your opening joke always lands flat like mine just did from nothing. Like when I was like, oh man, maybe you didn't think that's funny and it's even worse because you couldn't hear me and now I can't repeat it, but that'll be one that'll live on in infamy. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, no, what I was going to say is, though, that it's amazing how much people get wrong about you because just from the short interaction we had, so we've been emailing for a couple weeks just um, about getting you here on the show, um, you have quite possibly, and for how far your career goes back to at least the 80s, well, obviously the 80s, um, I can't believe how much documentation of your personal and professional career you have. I mean, I've seen in other interviews you do, you have um, scrapbooks full of your time at Gumby, your happy tree friends, bump in the night, clay fighter. And this was at a time where, I mean, you look at the Johnny Carson tapes where there's maybe a third of them left, where even back then the biggest show on television barely had any recording. You have, it seems like, I mean, if they had selfies and Instagram back then, you would have been, uh, look at the food I ate today kind of guy. It's incredible. Yeah, I know. Um, and I'm really glad that I, I have done that through the years, um, especially during the 80s, because I don't remember the 80s pretty much. Um, but during the 80s is when I really started scrapbooking. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been the pack rat. But then I started gluing shit into books because that way it would be harder to lose. And I've documented most of the projects I've worked on pretty extensively. And as you said, that's great for moments like this and moments when I you know, am so demented that I can't even remember <laughs> what I did for breakfast. Yeah, it's, it's uh, all veiled in the, uh, in the vein of vanity. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that too. Um, can mommy look at me now? Pontac. So, okay, so I got to ask you this, though. So, again, we were, and I'm, I, I don't like to share anything that isn't made public, but just between you and me, you were sending me pictures of um, some of your Christmas adventures. I don't know if there's somebody I've ever seen, you talk, you see people, oh, he loves animation, he loves being animated. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody, when they say this person's animated, 
I've never seen somebody love to dress up in costumes so much. There's pirates, there's monsters, there's, I mean, even your nicest thing, like um, like a Christmas tree. That is something if you showed a kid, he would have nightmares. He's like, why do we have Christmas trees in our house? I saw this man. Right. Santa's scary. I'm about <laughs> to show you uh, the armor that one of my dogs had. Let's see. Are we? Oh, my goodness. There we go. That's that was, hilarious. Uh, that was my dog, Whistle. And um, actually, this here is his altar. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like to do anything that isn't overdone. Uh, so, yeah, even our dog has armor. My wife dresses up. Um, yeah. Um, animated is, is a good term. I just like to... I like to do I just like to do stuff. I like to have fun. Yeah, and I think that's a lost sort of a lost art because the fun you have is some is the kind that I grew up on, very silly, very goofy. And I feel like a lot of animation now, how much I love it, but I feel like animators and cartoon creators are almost treated like rock stars now. I mean, Yay. You, <laughs> I mean, you see them at conventions and people are swarming them. And it's just, I, I made a cartoon about a turtle that runs fast. Like, it's not a, but, I mean, it, it's great because you have, you have fun the way that I remember it growing up. Like, you want to be silly. You want to go out and meet kids. And it's a really gratifying feeling, it looks like, especially the way that you do it. Because you do it with a little bit of a, with a spook, which is a lost art, I feel. I mean, you look at those old Don Bluth movies, right? Those, some of them were terrifying, <laughs> the Pee Wee's Playhouse, Large Marge, terrifying. I feel like you're one of those last people holding on to that. Yeah, kids should have a good time watching this after they're done being frightened. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God, I remember the very first script I wrote. Um, I might have written a bump in the night script. That was before we were in production, and I wrote it because we, you know, we had to have some scripts. But my first script that ended up on TV was a Mighty Max episode. Mm -hmm. um, let sleeping dragons lie. And um, there was a wizard named Ravendark. And um, the only way that this curse could be broken, uh, it was a blood curse. And he had to fucking kill himself. And I literally, and it, you know, it's funny is that Ravendark, um, his voice was done by uh, Jim Cummings. Mm -hmm. Well, I had no idea. I had no idea who he was. I didn't know anything about that part of animation and he ended up being mr bumpy which is kind of funny mm -hmm. but back to raven dark the only way that he could break the curse um he says um only blood will break or, I, that's a terrible accent he's supposed to be um icelandic i think only blood will break the curse and max says um oh gee i just gave it the blood mobile last week and raven dark says no my blood and he takes his sacrificial knife and he raises it and I think we even have a frame, couple of frames of him moving it towards him, and then we cut because, you know. But you couldn't ever get close to that now on uh, on regular, well, there isn't network TV, but broadcast standards and practices would would just explode if you even wrote that on a piece of paper. You know what's funny you mentioned that? Because mm -hmm. you obviously worked on Happy Tree Friends. That stuff you could get away with, that's fine. Exploding eyes, legs getting cut off. But if you even insinuate self-harm in any kind of way, it's it's an amazing, the censorship is just, it's even whether or not you want to say it's appropriate or not, sometimes it's just, it's just confusing. Oh, God, yeah. Um, when I worked on Bump in the Night, which was the first animated series I worked on that was mine, where I was getting the notes, um, I originally wanted to do stuff like have Mr. Bumpy <laughs> stick a fork in a wall socket and be all electrocuted and then Molly would grab him and then Squishy would grab him and there would be conga music. I thought that would be, like, would be funny as hell. Um, but clearly that, that was not the thing that could be done. I wanted him to light his farts and fly around the room. Um, and then I got my first notes back from Broadcast Standards and Practices and I just went, wait, what? Um, I actually compiled all those notes into an article called Please Delete the Following, <laughs> which has been in Harper's Magazine. It's been in several books about animation. Um, I can read you excerpts if you'd like. Um, some of them are pretty funny. And some of them actually, in retrospect, do make sense. It's like, 
oh yeah, that is, you know, a slightly charged political or sexual or racial statement. Maybe I shouldn't have even advocated that. But I, we woke them. <laughs> I want to know what you pitched where they said it was all sexual, political, racial. Like, yeah, Mr. Bumpy, and then he does a little dance. Can listen. This is the fifth time we've had you in today. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm uh, bringing up that document now. Yeah. Please do. Please delete the following. Okay. So um, I broke it down into uh, different different uh, deleterious content, as I wrote in the article. <laughs> There's acts of interpersonal violence, dangerous and inner or imitable actions, tastefulness or lack thereof. Is that my phone reminding me of something? No, that's my wife's phone reminding her of something. That that tune, that something is happening tune that your phone gives you, mm -hmm. is a fucking earworm. Um, <laughs> I hear so, it. I hear it even when it, my phone's not in the room. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. I'm mm -hmm. gonna wait till that's done with. Sure. Do you know? Yeah. Is, ah. that, is that the censors? Are they saying this interview? Yeah, that's the censors. <laughs> that's Mary Conley. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, um, you know, from the grave. Um, sorry, Mary. I don't really wish you were dead now. Back then I did. <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, oh, I'll t I could tell you about her, but then I would get into it. It would be uh, uh, libel. Um, anyway. <laughs> The uh, the deleterious content includes acts of interpersonal violence, dangerous and imitable actions, tastefulness or lack thereof, adult sexual humor, offenses, offensive or ridiculing references, and sarcasm. Fucking <laughs> sarcasm. So I'll just go down the list and, and pick a couple of greatest hits out of all of them. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Acts, uh, <laughs> the first one, acts of interpersonal violence. Please ensure that the action in which the character's limbs are tied into knots does not appear as painful. <laughs> uh, let's see. Please ensure that the grabbing of the chicken's neck should not appear as a choke. Now, that could be adult sexual actions, too, if we say that he's choking the chicken. Yeah. I was a little confused about that one. So, how does he, does he have to caress the neck? Oh, well, yeah, he's got to caress it first. You don't just start choking it right away. You <laughs> take it out to dinner. You put on some nice music. Light some candles. Know. Exactly. So, uh, really quick to interrupt, are these all for Bump in the Night? Or are all these just across? all for Bump in the Night. This is only the notes I got on Bump in the Night. Ken, what are these? I got an, What do these scripts look like before the final product where these are all the, <laughs> all the notes? Um, they look like harmless children's television. <laughs> all right. That's, that's a good answer. All right. What are the rest? I got to hear the rest, too. Dangerous and imitable actions. Um, let's see. This begins with, as agreed. Okay, I just have to give you a sidebar. Mm -hmm. and it might even say there. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 um, yeah, it, it does have a sidebar. As agreed, the car will accelerate into flight, so it is actually flying through the air by the time it approaches the wall. This bit of action distances the stunt from the real-life world of children's play, where the laws of physics must apply. <laughs> Thereby, we hope, reducing the likelihood of a child trying to drive his big wheel through the wall. Because, of course, every kid that sees that is going to want to go, I want to try that. <laughs> um, and so my parenthetical is, the term, as agreed, is a trick of the censor when leaving a paper trail. There is generally no previous agreement in these instances. Um, let's see. <laughs> Please avoid references to a game entitled the Suicide Roller Skate Death. <laughs> okay, that might be fair. Um, also, do not discuss the normal outcome of this game as being a trip through the washing machine rinse cycle. <laughs> Substitute something which is not potentially dangerous, imitable, or attractive. <laughs> I, I can't... So I want to imagine if they're reading this and laughing and then crossing this off, or if they're just stone-faced... Okay, now I have to tell you about, um, I mentioned the name, but I won't repeat it, um, the censor. Mm -hmm. uh, this woman was out of central casting. She was, looked like a school marm, ramrod straight, uh, the um, white blouse buttoned up to the top. Um, I think she had a, like a, a red vest, but I'm not sure. Um, the bangs cut like that the severe look on her face 
Um, it was perfect. It was so perfect, as a matter of fact, that she was also giving notes at the time to reboot, mm -hmm. um, which um, back then, at least locally, it was bump in the night and then reboot, mm -hmm. back to back. Um, and they created a character called MC, who was an actual MC. I, no, who was a censor. Uh, MC was a censor, and uh, that stands for the, the initials of the person. Um, and they literally had this character, MC, who looked like sort of a reboot-esque, you know, rectangular, but it kind of had the bangs and it had the, the glasses and stuff, going around being a pain in the ass telling people not to do shit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's a, I mean, now that you've had kind of the perspective of time though, yes. do you feel that her job, I mean, look, as creators, you want to be able to do anything you want, but there are certain, you know, standards and practices on TV. Do you think that she, despite her icy cold demeanor, do you think it is a thankless job where you did kind of need that necessary evil though? She probably enforced it a way that you didn't appreciate Oh, yeah. It's, it's like being a, a meter maid with, in her case, with a bad attitude. Um, I have dealt with other people in BS&P who, A, are much more flexible, and B, kind of do it with a smile. Mm -hmm. um, this, this person was humorless. Uh, that ramrod straightness I was talking about mm -hmm. was because the stick up her ass went all the way <laughs> to the top of her head. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's amazing how how much attitude can really affect a working relationship. I mean, if she gave you the same notes and she's like, listen, you know, I know you guys, this is funny, but just because they won't let us get away with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll give you another example of this person and their perspective. Um, when we first aired, there, were a lot, there was a lot less content out there, a lot less ways to get the content. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an online uh, anything. So um, we were basically, uh, it was ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. And um, we got our asses kicked the first week, mm -hmm. um, especially by Batman, which I think was on Fox against us then. Mm -hmm. And her comment was, well, thankfully, nobody's watching the show. <laughs> because in her mind... The big win would be if nobody ever watched the show, there would be nobody to offend, and it would be a beautiful world. That's where this uh, person is going to What an added... I mean, whether or not you like the show, and you hear this all the time from creative people, just... I mean, I think Pat McAfee, he just... I, I don't know if you are if you follow sports at all, but he was saying about... Yeah, well, just creative people in general. E even if you don't like the content... Part of your job is don't you want it to succeed as a producer, as a censor, as anything? I mean, look, if you have a show, if, if she's saying, man, I hate Bump in the Night, but it's the number one kids show in the nation, I mean, don't you want to keep that up? I mean, how does it behoove you to have the project you're working on fail? I'll tell you how. Um, just recently, like at this moment right now, um, Warner Brothers killed the Coyote versus uh, mm. Acme. Mm -hmm. animated feature which everybody who saw it loved it i don't know if you're familiar with there was a might have been in the new yorker there was an article called um coyote versus acme mm -hmm. everybody who's listening should look that up and read it it's basically acme uh the coyotes attorney su um, suing acme for all their defective equipment mm -hmm. and um, it's absolutely hilarious and they made a feature out of it but some bean counters decided that <laughs> that they would make more money by killing it and recouping their losses using some bean counter formula that fortunately my brain can't even grasp. Um, so that's a reason that somebody might want something to fail. And that's a real short term way to look at it because I mean, you see um, properties that don't succeed immediately, but then you hear they have cult status, they have this. And even if you maintain the rights to it, if you release it on a Looney Tunes 100th anniversary, I mean, just streaming what you can make alone on ads, and it, yeah. it's it's a very poor decision. But I don't think people who are blocking these things are very. Um, I don't think they're very current with the way things work. I think they're still working in people watch TV, people go to the movies. When it's the total opposite, people aren't watching TV, people aren't really going to the movies. Everything's done with streaming. It's every everything they're doing is backwards. 
Yeah. Yeah, they're the last people to get it, I think. Yeah, and it's funny because then all the things that you see are successful are the creators. They're doing it on YouTube. They're promoting it this way on their own website. And yep. then and then TV gets behind, or, you know, executives get behind it like, yeah, we should put it on TV. And then they're surprised, well, why isn't it working on TV at 3 a.m. in the morning? Yep. And another thing about Bump, well, it was doomed no matter what because when ABC – was purchased by Disney, mm -hmm. that was it. Yeah. Um, every every non-Disney show that was on Saturday morning was just killed off the table. But that being said, I think Bump of the Night was just ahead of its time. I think it would have been, instead of the underground hit that it is now, mm -hmm. it would have been a, a legitimate hit if it had come out in the, in the past 10 years or so. Yeah, and I think part of what makes that, because I was thinking about the other, that the other day, I was looking at the lineup of cartoons, and there were some really good cartoons, but I think that the um, stop motion, the actual physical look, because you look at any of those, I mean, um, are you familiar with uh, Coat Zellers? He did um, Prometheus and Bob on Kablam? No. Oh, so if you are you familiar with Kablam on Nickelodeon? It was sort of a variety show, and then he did Prometheus yeah. and Bob with the caveman and um, the alien. Who the alien was trying to? He was recording himself teaching the caveman how to do things, and it was like slapstick. It was a silent thing, but it was really yeah. funny. But you see shows like that, and there was a lot in the late '80s and early '90s, and they stand out in ways that other shows don't. Like other shows might have great writing, but they feel dated. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Bumping these shows don't feel dated. I mean, if you put it out on YouTube now, this would be the best looking thing because you know, with flash animation, however good it looks, it still doesn't look um, like those frames per minute. It still doesn't have that sort of fluid quality to it. But this, it looks just as good animated now as anything does. I mean, the new Chicken Run came out. It looks just as good as that, and that's Thank thirty you. years later. We had some great animators. Uh, a lot of them started on Gumby. Uh, when some of them weren't great animators because uh, Art Cloakie would basically hire anybody who could show him a 16 millimeter thing where clay or a puppet moved. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them, they just learned. You do it over and over again and you have people who know how to direct directing you. Um, you get some amazing stuff. There were guys like Tim Hiddle who just started out great. Um, mm -hmm. My God, when we got his reel, everything stopped. Art and I even stopped fighting. Uh, <laughs> that's how intensely great Tim's work was. Um, and a lot of those animators ended up on Bump in the Night. And by that time, they were really good. Uh, so, and, you know, Henry Selleck used the same animators that we did. You know, was, he, and they all, they all went to work for Henry because working on a feature is sexier than working on a TV show. Um, but that was the level that we had then. And, yeah, it holds up to anything. And it's amazing because you see, I mean, animation itself is sort of incestuous in that you see the same 20 people working on every project. But yeah. for Bump in the Night, I could not believe the success that at least half the people went on to have. And that's yeah. going to be a great feeling for something that you were the father of, to have all these kids go out and just have wild success. It is really gratifying, honestly, because... I have met so many people and my brain doesn't hold proper nouns very well. Um, I have people walk up to me on the street that I bump into that, that worked on Bump in the Night. And they go, God, Ken, thank you. You got my career started. That was the greatest job I ever had. And um, often I'll smile and nod, but I tend to just cop to it and say, I am sorry. I can't remember who you are. Can you? I, and it's nothing personal. I can't remember who anything is. Um, who anybody is, can you tell me some shared experience? And sometimes they get, might get a little offended, but most of the time people enjoy being, other people being honest with them. And then I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that now. And the bottom line of this sort of, as you notice, I kind of ramble off and then get back to the main point again. Uh, a lot of people got their careers started. We had a very uh, vigorous intern program where people from uh, SF State, would get credit for working on the stage and then we would hire them because we knew how good they were they knew our our system and so a lot of jobs just people really started from nowhere and got their careers going yeah and i mean for anybody that would you know see you on the street 
I feel like now I'm going to do that. I'm like, Ken, remember I worked on Bump of the Night? You owed me a hundred bucks. And you're like, <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Um, I will pay you the hundred bucks as soon as uh, Disney pays me all the royalties that they haven't. <laughs> well, is it is Bump of the Night streaming right now? Is it on Disney Plus? I don't think so. Um, it's all over YouTube. Yeah. But, um, Disney streamed it on Disney Plus or what there well there was no whatever Disney uh online entity existed after Bump in the Night mm-hmm. um or maybe it was on TV it's a long time ago um and uh that was I think the only time that they ever showed it I think it was one and done um and periodically I have my agent call up whoever at Disney, like I, I kind of figure, okay, those guys have now moved on, and there's new guys to ask, mm-hmm. and ask them if they're interested in doing another series. And basically, the answer is, well, the the answer is no, <laughs> and the answer is kind of like, you know, we we like having uh, Bumpy as our IP, but we don't really like having it as anything new that we do. Um, I'll keep asking, and maybe one day we will do it. That's so funny because you think that, I mean, I understand that there's only so much money to go around, but you would think that even if you weren't going to do anything new with it, you would at least want to have it out there. I mean, that must be one of the most frustrating things for somebody because I I know that um, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, to get into TV, you had to sell the rights and everything basically to Mr. Bumpy. So, I mean, you got to work on the project, obviously, but... Not that you regret it, because I'm sure that you know you've, you've always had a long career. But do you regret not being able to have at least some sort of control over? Well, I get to do this with my, Mr. Bumpy now. Or oh, sure. Um, I, I imagine any parent that sells their baby into slavery to start their new life feels <laughs> a little bit of regret, and that's what we did. Uh, that was David uh, Ichioka. Uh, back then, it was David Blyman and I worked on. Uh, Gumby together. I mean, we went to elementary school together and high school together. And, you know, we worked on the yearbook together and we were the two guys who did all the art stuff. And then we worked on Gumby together for our our first, well, actually we worked on special effects before that together too. Um, But Gumby was our first animated series that we worked on together. And then we, we pitched a show called The Danger Team and sold a pilot for that. And then we sold Bump in the Night and realized, okay, this is, this is it. This is our thing. We created it. This is going to be on TV as a series. And in order to do that, we have to say bye-bye to it. Um, you know. And we knew exactly what was going to happen. And it did, actually. It started our careers, and our baby had new parents that... <laughs> Didn't, don't allow visitation rights. <laughs> you know what is good, though? I mean, for as frustrating as it must be to not be able to have um, the rights to it, at least you can go to bed knowing, man, that was a really quality, great show. Because so many times you hear about people, they pitch a show, and they, you know, we have two seasons to work on it. Or, and then, like, what happens to you? They get bought up in a merger, and the show is just dismantled by executives or by the company or by just infighting. I mean, you can look at this show, and I, I would hope, I'm, I'm imagining, that you look on it with pride. Like, wow, this turned out to be great, especially on your first show. I mean, that's... Yeah. The quality is insane how good it is. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't even really feel regret. Um, nostalgia, for sure. Um, but it did exactly what I wanted it to do. I, we knew what was going to happen. Um, and uh, it, it's a little frustrating that, that they don't show it more, that they don't want to do a new one. But that's, that's up to their, that's them, their business. Um, It's the same thing. I try to have absolutely no ego involved when I'm writing something and I get notes. Mm -hmm. Um, If they're stupid notes, it's like, Jesus. Um, But, you know, I will kill my babies all the time. Or what is it? um, I think it's uh, kill your darlings is what William Burroughs came up with. Um, And, uh, you know, if there's some great idea that just doesn't fit in the script and somebody says, you know, that really needs to go. It's like, yeah, it does. That that shit doesn't bother me because it's it's all about the it's all about the end result. It's all about 
the project, the show. What is the thing that makes it the best? And in that context, selling our baby was the thing that was the best. And it doesn't bother me. I mean, it doesn't bother me, you know, speaking about now, and I'm getting off topic again, but it's all the same topic. Um, as far as ego and regret and all that kind of stuff, this many years in the business has given me a bulletproof skin. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing bothers me. Um, stupidity bothers me, but it should bother, that should bother anybody. But, you know, insults, I mean, God, you know, you know about me and Sonic fandom. Um, <laughs> if you don't, just Google my name and Sonic and you'll see. Although, all of a sudden, um, all, a lot of the people who were hating on me and Warren for shitting on their childhood mm -hmm. um, are starting to look back and apologize. Um, <laughs> Warren just posted something on um, one of his online presences, maybe TikTok. Mm -hmm. Somebody talked about the way that, that he and I uh, were introduced to Sonic and the information that we were given, and he just had to correct it. He said, mm -hmm. no, that's not how it happened. It actually happened like this. We had way less control than you guys think about the stories and the content. And everything we did, did Sega requested us to do, or at least approved. Um, it's not like we had some power and we could just put whatever we wanted about Sonic. Let's <laughs> fuck with the fans. Let's have Sonic, you know, do this and that. It's, no, that's not how it works. And when that was explained, all of a sudden there was just this string of apologies of, wow, you know, I guess we were kind of hard on you guys. And gee, we owe you an apology. So um, that's gratifying. But back when they were insulting me, it's like, yeah, what, whatever. And I would even start winding them up. You know, I started to troll <laughs> them back because um, that was fun. I would have Death loved to guess my dog, though. No. <laughs> I would have loved to see the notes from your Sonic time. Uh, Mr. Pontac, <laughs> listen, we can't have Sonic choke the chicken. <laughs> Just the same uh, notes that, that 40 is totally, years. That is an Eggman thing. Sonic would not do <laughs> Well, I want to read really quick, um, actually, um, your co-writer, his, um, his quote. He goes, um, so this is from sonicstadium.org. Um, that's listed the reference. Sega and Sonic Team's influence didn't stop there. Graf said that, quote, every word we wrote, every character trait, and every story point was given to us by them. So uh, they had a very strong dictation on where the story evolved, how the characters behaved, and what they said. Whatever wasn't provided by Sonic Team and Sega was, instead, based on the Sonic Game Bible. So, I want to kind of clear that up really quick, because exactly what you're saying, um, what, what is it that your role... Because I think a lot of people think, alright, um, Sega hired these two, and they just had their way with it. But that's not really... I think a lot of people don't understand when you're, in a create, when you're hired in a creative position, unless you're creating the show, and even then you have limitations you're going to have to abide by a very strict standard of rules. And in Sonic the Hedgehog, which is, I mean, really one of the biggest animated IPs ever, the movies, the cartoons, the games, you have very limited control. They can tell you, all right, make Sonic run through this loop. And you do it, and you get 100 notes on him running through the loop. Well, his feet weren't spread far enough. His, so what, would, what was your guys' main role as far as, quote-unquote, writing for these games? It actually varied. Um, it went all the way to basically localization, where we would get an Excel spreadsheet with um, with the Japanese in Japanese, and next to it uh, a translation. Um, sometimes it's a funny translation, uh, and then we would Americanize it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, that happened in um, I forget the names of them. Uh, with Sonic Sonic Forces, maybe the, one of the last ones we did. Um, the one where Sonic um, spends time in jail, uh, <laughs> captured, um, and we actually wanted his friends to think that he was dead, and we couldn't use the word dead. And mm -hmm. um, but that one basically, we just sort of rewrote every line that they gave us, or at least reimagined the concept, and and it was really that was completely Japanese control. Mm -hmm. um, on others, we were given more leeway, um, kind of told what should happen in, you know, before this cutscene, these things are going are, are gonna to happen in, in gameplay. Um, and so this should reflect on that. And, you know, they, they should be talking about this or doing these things. And then we'll go into more gameplay and do another cutscene. Other times, 
uh, we would write the cutscenes before there was any gameplay figured out. Uh, it, it was really case by case. The bottom line being that um, actually Warren got something wrong. Uh, they did not give us every word. Otherwise, they wouldn't need us. Then we would just be transcribing the words they gave us. Mm -hmm. So even Warren gets it wrong when talking about <laughs> ourselves. Everything is wrong. Um, just keep that in mind. If you come away with nothing else from watching this, don't believe anything you see. Um, or at least are told. Only believe things you see. And don't even do that because there's deep fakes. Shit, we're doomed. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny because... Um, I mean, as far as just the Sonic fandom goes, it seems like, I mean, and look, I, I'm a fan, but every five, <coughs> excuse me, initially they hate everything, and then five years later, it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> We're approaching that now. Actually, since we've been working on it, we worked on it for over about 10 years, actually. Um, that should have happened, you know, five years ago. Uh, but I guess as long as we were still working on it, the, the hate was strong. Yeah, and I mean... People should know just content wise. See, I gotta cough really quick. Hold on. Sorry, I was thinking of something funny. <laughs> but for people who are like, man, these two guys, they just they did what they want. They they abused it. They did creative. <coughs> Excuse me. The start of your story began with, yeah, we were sent over an Excel spreadsheet. That's the basis for creativity in anything. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, and I hate Excel spreadsheets. Um, I don't know how they work. It's like, wait, how did I just create 10 new columns? And what happened to the shit I just typed? And isn't there a, a spell check on this? And, oh, it's the worst. It's, it is the worst writer's tool in the world. Um, a lot of the time, they let us just write it as a Word document or even as a, a final draft script. And somebody there, God bless their souls, would put it in the spreadsheet. Anytime I had to put it in a spreadsheet, it tripled my writing time. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't understand how it, I'll press enter and I'll say, do you want to create this formula? And I just no, I'm typing my grocery list. What do you mean this formula? I, I'm, like, I feel like I have to work at NASA just to type in A1, B1. Yep. And I'll, I'll say that there were several instances where I absolutely didn't mind typing in the Excel sheet. When I was writing barks for the... Um, one of the Marvel uh, MMOs um, that had to be nine lines or nine words or less. Um, and it literally would say, you know, um, Wolverine um, announces his entrance. And there's like five things. Um, and so the first one, you know, and so it's, it's Wolverine section, Wolverine, uh, announces his ex his entrance, and then the column for me to write in. Mm -hmm. And I can fit, um, I'm the best at what I do, and what I do ain't nice, um, in in a small thing, and not have to worry about spell spelling it or writing paragraphs or anything like that. And those jobs were great, actually. Now I'm getting a little bit off. Well, I'm, we're, we were talking about spreadsheets, and, and I'm still doing <laughs> If we're um, talking about spreadsheets, we're way off from anything. But the fact that I roll along with you, we're kindred yeah. spirits. So if we're off, that means we're on. So that was, those are some of my favorite jobs in the world, is writing character barks. Because, A, I know Marvel inside and out. Um, I grew up reading that stuff. And being able to put the, the words into the mouths of my heroes was amazing. Also, um, I was given, ultimately, thousands of these. And it was $10 a bark, wow. which means that I could write down the word snicked and look over at my wife and say, I just got $10. <laughs> and then I could be more clever and write down um, one that actually didn't get done, I think, um, where uh, Kitty Pride, who is Jewish, um, when she enters, she says, let's kick some tushy, I think it was. Or she uses some, some, you know, uh, Yiddish term, and uh, I would go, What? I just made $20. And then um, Rogue would say to Squirrel Girl, um, I apologize if some of my kin, or if, if some of my, uh, wait a second, I apologize if I have ever eaten some of your kin as vittles because, <laughs> you know, she's southern mm -hmm. and so they're eat squirrels maybe sorry southern people maybe you don't eat squirrels um and i might get a note from that from bsmp um 
But then I would look over and say, I just made $30. And I made so much money doing something that was so easy. Um, it was a dream job. So speaking of Marvel, we, I mean, your writing, it's... I can't believe, first of all, the eclectic career you've had. I mean, comic books, video games, TV, mo- just the most eclectic. And your writing style, first of all, again, you've had Sonic where it's, you know, fun lines, silly lines. Marvel, these, you know, characters that are larger than life having these mad world. But what is the best line you've written for Marvel? What is your favorite? If you're going to frame one frame in a speech oh, bubble, what's your favorite one? Wow. I would have to look through. I mean, I wrote, I wrote thousands and thousands of lines. Um, and uh, let me just call up a spreadsheet and see if I can pick one. I'll tell you the thing, my proudest thing, I laminated it. Um, my, uh, my story editor got, Brian Bendis was like um, an executive producer. And my story editor um, forwarded an email where Bendis was saying, uh, that uh, he thought that I had nailed the Wolverine stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, mm-hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. So, you know, that it, that's like getting a blessing from God. <laughs> uh, let me just see if I can um, uh, get anything up here. Marvel. And I do uh, like that you were willing to work with these smaller characters. Like, I love Squirrel Girl. That's an ex- extremely underrated character. And um, uh, Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to say one of my other favorites who um who's a little underrated too is Jubilee from X-Men. Right. I love Jubilee. I love that yellow raincoat. Something about the 90s and women in yellow jumpsuits and raincoats like uh Rogue and April O'Neil from Ninja Turtles, Jubilee. For some reason that was the uniform at the time, I guess. Yeah, it sure was. Um and and lots of pouches. Lots, <laughs> lots of, of pouches. pouches. And that was a um oh what's his name? The guy everybody hates um the the you know with the gritty teeth and he can't he can't draw feet um <laughs> oh um yeah i know who you're talking about that's so funny i think to draw that's how, how every artist is though every artist has some body part they can't draw well for me it's yeah, the yeah. body and face um and limbs. You know, I, I, i'm not i'm not finding any uh right away but um there was one i really liked at wolverine when he uh was fighting the blob he said um you're about to lose 30 pounds of flab real fast. <laughs> I, I like that one, but um, there were some really funny ones. And I got to write, I got to write um, some of the big boys. Like, mm-hmm. I got all the X-Men, which was fun. I got, um, I got a lot of Thor stuff. And um, a lot of the characters, like Squirrel Girl and stuff, um, they weren't... It was just when one of the main characters meets this character... So I didn't necessarily write a bunch of Squirrel Girl lines. But I got to write like squir- what Squirrel Girl says when she meets the other character or something like that. Um, anyway, it was totally fun. And then I did the same thing with the same story editor who then worked on a couple of zombie games for a different company. And, uh, you know, zombie games are fun too. Oh, yeah. And uh, so let me ask you this, though. Okay, because, again eclectic total thing but where it all started with oh really quick i'm gonna read a comment too because we have some folks watching and um please yeah so this is from marcus blackwell um he says it's a two-parter i like to think of bump in the night as american wallace and gromit because of its quality that must be that's that's pretty nice that's super nice and let me just say thank you marcus and uh we actually did have the a couple of the urban guys visit the studio and Mm. uh they were super nice. I've met them a couple of times. Super nice and, and well impressed, um, which is like, it's like getting another blessing, you know? Yeah, and, and really quick to jump off that, you know who's extremely underrated in that stop motion department? Do you know um, Walter Williams? No. Walter Williams was the director and the creator of Mr. Bill from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you remember him? Oh, of course. And I have to say, uh, that was not stop motion. He never moved. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. I was I thinking, that, sorry, go ahead. But that, that's fine. I mean, I, I just always point that out because, um, because. You know what? I He did do that, I believe, West Stop Motion that I always get mixed up. He did the um, the Pizza Head show. Do you remember that those? I'm not familiar with. So it was these uh, series of ads, I want to say for Pizza Hut or Domino's, and it was a slice of pizza, and he had the Mr. Bill style face. 
And right. it was just the same thing, just advertising pizzas. Really cute. But like I said, there's like five of you guys who in the late 80s and early 90s who just took over that space. And there's those six shows. And it was just really funny. Right. But uh, <clears throat> sorry. So Marcus says, did you write the bump in the night music or just the dialogue and episode plots? Um, I wrote uh, the first season. Uh, there was a guy named Jeff Moss mm -hmm. who wrote all the songs. Uh, and I believe he also composed them. Um, he worked on Sesame Street forever. He's a legend. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote It's Not Easy Being Green and, oh, wow. and a lot of stuff. He was one of the Sesame Street originals. Super nice guy. Um, and uh, then second season and third season, which uh, was never produced, but the songs are on a bonus feature on the latest uh, collection. The I forget who did that collection. But anyway, um, our underscore composer... Jim, uh, uh, Jim Latham wrote the music for all the songs, and I wrote the lyrics for all of them. Uh, David wrote a couple of the lyrics, or, uh, lyrics for a couple of the songs, but I, I primarily wrote all the songs for second and third season. Um, I hear a whining puppy. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Ooh. This <laughs> is the reason I didn't get much sleep <laughs> last night. Oh, my goodness. Who is that? This is Ziggy Stardust, um, our <laughs> brand new, as of last night, Cholowitz Quintley, which is a Mexican hairless. Uh -huh. As you can see, he is hair almost hairless. Wow. Um, cute as shit. And um, still figuring out that he even lives in this place. <laughs> you so, you um, picked him up last night? He was, yeah, we, he was delivered last night. Um, we actually purchased him um, over a month ago, I think. And the, his breeder has been keeping him uh, until he's had it, his shots and all that stuff. Wow. Um, yeah. That's cool. I love the spots. If he had any more spots, he'd be on Cruella DeVille's list. I, I love it. It's really cute. I don't say he yeah. would. I know. Blame my writers for that one. I wrote the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I didn't see that one. I did not watch that train wreck, but I certainly heard about it. You know what? The, to be fair, that's such a... I mean... So... I don't think that joke, I don't have a problem with that joke in particular because it's a joke. I mean, I don't think he was really lambasting his writers. For anybody who doesn't know, Joe Coy hosted, was it the Emmys, the Emmy Awards? Uh, Golden Globes. Golden Globes. Golden Globes, right, babe? Yeah. And he was having a, and for anybody who doesn't know, that's Ken's handler in the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and personal nurse. And personal nurse. I married a nurse. Everybody should marry a nurse because they can resuscitate you. <laughs> um. So Joe Coy had this, he, he wasn't doing very well, and he had a joke that did well, and he said, that was one of my jokes, and for the ones you don't like, blame the writers, something to that effect, and people are getting on him, how could you blame the writers, and I don't think people are realizing it's a joke. In stand-up, people will sometimes do that to lighten the mood, you know, be funny. So for me personally, I don't have a problem with it, maybe other people do, but it's on when you're on stage, you don't have anything to fall back on, it's literally what you say next, and... I don't know. I, I don't have a problem with that. And especially when you're basically dying on stage, um, you know, you want to try to maybe keep the laughter going. It's like, mm -hmm. Jesus, I finally laughed at something. Maybe, th maybe this will fly. Oh, it didn't. They hate me again. <laughs> um, yeah. Stand up is an arena that I have not attempted to tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to actually do my first spoken word thing, supposedly in a month or two, which should be interesting. Uh, I'll let you know how that goes. Yeah, are you doing it? Um, uh, Ken is up in uh, uh, Northern California. Are you doing it in the city or? I'm, I'll be doing it in um, in Marin, and um, there's a guy named Don Reed, mm -hmm. and if you look him up, he just has insane juice. Um, he was uh, the crowd warmer for Jay Leno for many mm -hmm. many years, and he's worked with he's worked um, in features and television and he has this one man show uh that just kills and um he became a friend of mine during covid we basically got a, a zoom bromance going <laughs> and um i told this story about uh how i set my bed on fire when i was underneath it when i was 13 years old um that he said okay you've got to do you got to do that on stage when i put together this show I can't even so, imagine the magazines you were trying to hide from your family when you had to light your bed on fire. Ken, I'm going to oh look at your bed right now. No, you okay, won't. Okay, speaking, speaking about my family uh, and this, this is, once again, this is pretty much on topic. Um, as you can tell from this interview, 
uh, I'm completely open about everything in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, pretty much, pretty much everything. Not the stuff that could get me arrested and tell the stuff <laughs> the limitations is, goes, but besides that. So, um, I get a call from my mom. And she says, uh, hi, Ken. I go, hi, mom. She says, uh, I just got a computer. I said, oh, that's great. You're going to love it. It's going to open the world for you. She says, uh, yeah, I just Googled your name. That's what they call it, Google, right? And I said, yeah, mom, that's what they call it. I didn't know you did a bunch of drugs when you were a kid. Oh, no. <laughs> and I started cracking up. And I said, oh, I'm going to put that on Facebook. And I hang up. And she said, oh, I'm not on Facebook. And I said, don't get on Facebook. <laughs> I would say don't get on Google. Don't get, just don't look me up. I'm actually, that's a different Ken Pontac. Oh, my God. There are, there are a couple of things I really don't want her to know that are out there. Um, not shit I did as a kid, but um, particularly the Happy Tree Friends episode, Who's to Flame, which is based on my very first memory, which is, um, should I tell this story? Oh, yeah, please do. I'm sorry, I was just, I was, I thought you were asking that rhetorically. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, yeah. okay, I just, you know, wanted to know time-wise. Uh, we got a couple hours, and yeah. this is not a two-hour story. <laughs> so, I am so young that I'm sitting uh, in a high chair in my diapers, but actually... And you mean back then, not right now, right? I was going to say, uh, you know, don't kink shame. Uh, that was <laughs> me last week. But legitimately, uh, this was when I was doing that uh, as a kid, mm -hmm. or as a baby, even. Um, and, uh, and so it's breakfast time. Uh, my sister's next to me eating cereal. Uh, kettle's on the boil. My mom's on the phone talking to her, her mom. Um, she's wearing one of those uh, rayon, uh, you know petroleum product uh, nightgowns. You can see where this is going. Leans against the stove. The burner goes foomp. And from the waist up, she's a blazing human torch. Oh, um, no. I am strapped in my high chair, like, you know, <laughs> watching uh, as this image is, uh, pun intended, burned into my brain forever. She is running around screaming, neither stopping, dropping, or rolling. Um, and that went on for 10,000 years, basically. Um, <laughs> Probably seconds later, uh, my dad came out, came out of the um, bedroom with uh, blankets and put out the fire. Um, that's the part I remember. Uh, I guess I stayed at grandma's house for a couple of weeks and, you know, mom was in the hospital and all that. So I'm telling this story in the Happy Tree Friends writer's room. And we all start laughing because we're sick fucks. And, um, you know, it's happened a long time ago and uh, tragedy plus Time equals comedy, mm -hmm. except at Happy Tree Friends, where basically we cut out the middleman and tragedy equals comedy. Um, and somebody said, that would be a funny episode, except when, uh, when the character comes out and puts the fire out, the fire's out for a second, and then, boom, they're both on fire. <laughs> and then more shit happens. And so we did an episode called Who's to Flame? And uh, it's out there. And... I talk about it in interviews like this, and um, if she has ever heard about this, she hasn't mentioned it to me, and I dare say that she hasn't tried to watch it. <laughs> so that's so funny because that's that's how you can tell you're a creative-minded person. Most people, when they see something traumatic, they go, how am I going to recover from this? But creative people, they go, how can I use this? Mm -hmm. Lemons into lemonade. <laughs> That's right. An episode of Happy Tree Friends that occurred before I worked on it. That and was, I have a story about that, too, if you want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, of course. And that was the first episode of Happy Tree Friends I watched. And really quick, just to kind of lead you into that, yeah. um, I was going to say that for Happy Tree Friends, so the story from, again, other, th other things I've read on you is that you had seen and somebody had shown you an episode and, you know, your eyes popped out of your head and you got in touch with the uh, creators over there. And isn't it much easier having somebody else tell your story? And I'm getting it mostly right, but I'm sure there's something it's wrong. All in right, there. so far you are all right. <laughs> oh, I got in touch with the producer, who then got me in touch with the creators. But that's funny. <laughs> there's a, there's my wrong my wrong quote for the day. It's not even wrong. It's just sort of it's just wrong. <laughs> it's not even fully wrong. Yeah, I'll take I'll take a first syllable wrong. Um, and then you ended up working with them a couple years later because they were staffed. See, I did my homework on this. You sure did. I know. You I wish I would have done this me very efficiently. <laughs> um, but before that, it's kind of funny because when you saw Happy Tree Friends, I know, and for everybody in the 2000s, that was just 
a game changer as far as violence. Because, and I know there was a lot of controversy about people wanting to censor it, wanting to do this and that. But it's funny because you had in the 60s and the 70s, you had Tom and Jerry, which, I mean, I don't even know how much you could get away with that now. They're still doing it, but that was extremely violent. Let me do a callback on that. Mm -hmm. Remember that censor I was talking about? Yep. One of her jobs, because ABC was running um, the Bugs Bunny show back then on Saturday morning, um, one of her jobs was to censor those cartoons. And she cut out, she basically mutilated my creative parent Wow! Uh, in front of me. I knew the person who was basically cutting the balls <laughs> off of my father. Um, so, yeah. Um, it was you. It was able to be done originally, but um, as as society changes what is acceptable, more and more stuff gets cut out. Um, I just watched Fantasia with my mom, mm -hmm. uh, and um, had she cut on fire again? It was so fucked <laughs> up. Um, no, I just watched Fantasia with my mom, and at the beginning of it is an apology from Disney for some of the. Um, racial humor um mm -hmm. i think the mushrooms look like uh you know they're they're like coolie hats and the mushrooms are dancing yeah. around with slanty eyes and shit um <laughs> and you know what i think that is the appropriate way to do it um you don't you don't erase history you put it in context you explain why it's wrong and then you keep it intact maybe not in the same place um you don't necessarily necessarily have to smash confederate statues you can put them in the museum of fucked up statues along with all the nazi statues and all the other fucked up statues and you can go there or not but they exist as what really happened and as a cautionary tale yeah i agree 100 percent because um i mean when they try to cover up paintings with nudity or they try to do exactly what you said statues well you can't let your what you accept as moral or as okay you can't dictate that and that onto other people because for every one person that doesn't like it, there's a hundred people who do. I mean, that's why there's all these ancient Roman. I mean, I, you know, you go see in the David. There's people who want to cover the David up, but yeah, 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 yeah. But it's art. It's it's just a part of and the reaction that it elicits from you, the anger, or the hatred, or the offendedness. It's doing its job by getting that reaction out of you. The art doesn't have to be. You don't get the same reaction out of art for anything. Some person who like might like bump the night might hate it. Or they might think yep. it's gross or twisted. But that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be all things to everyone at any time. We actually took the hate mail, not all of it, <laughs> but we took uh, some of the best hate mail from Bump, uh, not Bump of the Night, from Happy Tree Friends mm -hmm. and turned it into a bonus feature. Lemons and the Lemonade again, um, which uh, then we can come back to, to Lemonade. See how we just kind of <laughs> always get back to the original point. Um, the reason that the eyes, when they're cut in half, spoiler alert to people mm -hmm. who haven't seen it, um, look like basically an orange, like a bisected orange, is because Ken Navarro refuses to do research on actual gore. It <laughs> skewed him out, which he should have never told me because weak underbelly. Okay, I will take advantage of that. Um, and so whenever possible, I would show him pictures of the gore that we were depicting. One of my favorites being one of my favorite injuries is degloving. Oh, when, no. like, you know what degloving is? Yes, yes. Uh, I'll explain it to the fans uh, or the viewers. I don't know if they're fans. Could be people that hate me. Um, <laughs> some of you do hate me. As a matter of fact, the people who hate me, could you please leave a message on the side and we can address that that uh, later? That's our anyway. Venn diagram. People who are watching are people who hate us both. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! It's it's one circle. Um, <laughs> So degloving is when um, basically the skin of your hand is ripped off, generally by wearing a ring while operating some kind of machinery. It's ripped off, and um, then you see all the viscera and stuff. And if it's done correctly, it still is um, attached by tendons and shit like that. So I had one where a finger had been basically ripped off and, and degloved. But it was still attached by like a tendon this long. It's like the hand was here, and then this was tendon, and the finger was over there. And I showed that one to Ken, and it got it was probably my favorite reaction. <laughs> How much vomit day. was there? Was <laughs> I never saw him puke? Um, 
we, um, I almost drowned uh, Warren Graff. Um, <laughs> well, we almost drowned Warren Graff uh, during when he was gargling water for, um, I forget the name of the one where Handy's trying to change a light bulb. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's difficult when you don't have hands. Um, and uh, we needed some kind of gargling. Oh, it was when he got his head caught in the fishbowl. And so Warren's got this, uh, we're in the sound booth, and Warren's got this uh, glass. I just remembered, this is in the bonus features, I think. It's like a window in a window. Um, and uh, he started cracking up. We said something funny, and he started choking. And fortunately, I was uh, shooting video of that entire moment. So, yeah, it's on a bonus feature. Um, that was a great moment. That was, I think, the closest any of us ever came to at our own deaths because of Happy Tree Friends. Um, we did literally fall off the chairs laughing not you know figuratively fall off the chairs Rody in particular was great at falling off the chair and then just laughing um i don't want to uh spend the time to dig it up and show you but out there is a clip that i shot of an entire brainstorm meeting called um buddhist monkey happy tree friends buddhist monkey or nudist monkey i should say because during a, a we were doing a Buddhist monkey episode and I pitched the idea of nudist monkey. And for five minutes, it's just all of us laughing so hard that we can barely come up with the gags we'll never use. Cause we never did nudist monkey. Um, I strongly recommend everybody look for that on YouTube. Everybody look it up on YouTube. Um, so, okay. I feel like, I feel like I'm getting a couple messages. People are asking, they actually want us to talk about things like, <laughs> it's great though because I feel like I'm just in your living room and we're just talking. I totally forgot there's a camera and everything on here. So um, okay, let's talk about some things. I'll, I'll pretend we'll pretend to be professional for once. Um, All right, or I will. I'll at least try to pretend to be. You please continue. So um, all right. I have to ask this because, again, with research, um, you said that your mom had told you you'd been drawing Mr. Bumpy since you were about seven years old, right? Pretty much, yeah, one way or another. Roughly. Do you remember the first time either you drew or actually came up with Mr. Bumpy or visualized him in your head? Well, that was when we actually had pitch a show called Bump. We're going to pitch a show called Bump in the Night, and we needed a monster. Um, I quickly came up with the eyes. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that I've been drawing forever. Um, the body, the mouth, um, yeah, the big mouth, the teeth, i had been drawing forever. Those things in those proportions, no, not really. So I had always been drawing monsters and a lot of the elements that ended up in Mr. Bumpy found themselves um, from my past. Mm -hmm. What we wanted with Mr. Bumpy was a big expressive face on legs with arms that could do shit too. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what he is. Um, And then the eye stalks, because I've been drawing that thing since I was seven years old, um, they ended up on him. And uh, he really turned out to be a great expressive character. Yeah, and I mean his mouth is his his makeup is so unique. His physical body, because he doesn't really have a body. I mean he does, but his muzzle. He's just basically a walking pair of eyes and mouth. Yeah, which you yeah, can't get it's more like, expressive than that. We did a whole episode called Gum Crazy, where he goes into his stomach. Where's his stomach? Oh, that was that was hilarious. I um. I did a video on Bump of the Night, the one that you, you – let me ask you really quick. So were you just searching – was it your mom Googling you and then YouTubing you and then she found it and she goes, Ken, is this about you? Uh, how did you actually come up on the video? Oh, I, I do an ego search um, <laughs> almost every day um, just because I like to find things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious to to see who's talking about me and, and how. Um, sometimes it might even turn into a business thing. It's like, oh, okay, I, I need to talk to that person about that thing. Um, so it's just part of my endless networking, which um, that is, I mean, that's how I got the job at Happy Tree Friends. That's how almost every good thing in my life has happened. Endless networking, reaching out to people who do something that I think is cool mm-hmm. and um, hoping that they get back in touch with me. Well, lucky for you, my aunt is Kathleen Kennedy, so... <laughs> is she? No, man. I, are you kidding me? I, if you already had, a, we already already had a Daisy Ridley led Bump in the Night reboot. If, I don't know who that is. Oh, she was uh, in the new Star Wars, the new uh, the new girl. 
in Star Wars. Oh, Wars. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Uh, <laughs> um, so let me take a look here. Okay, so part of the thing, too, that I like about cartoons and Mr. Bumpy in general is a lot of people watch a cartoon and they just say, all right, that was a good cartoon. What I love, though, is to me, Mr. Bumpy, he exists in this world. But what we don't see on screen, this backstory, this lore, because for all I know, Mr. Bumpy acts like a little kid. He, act, he acts like a five-year-old, but with the arrogance of like a 35-year-old. He's hilarious. But in my mind, I think, well, he lives under the bed. Has he, is he an ancient being from a thousand years old? Is he a little kid? Does he have parents? Does he sprout from fungus? Like, what is Mr. Bumpy's backstory? Boy, sprout from fungus is pretty nice. Um, honestly, if I were to tell you his backstory, I would be making it up right here and now. <laughs> Um, the kind of broader story is that everybody's got a Mr. Bumpy under their bed, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, or a, a monster under their bed that is tailored to their needs. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a closet monster. Um, everybody's got a comfort doll. Um, that's the easiest one because they physically exist in the world. There are many, many of them. And Molly was based partly on Raggedy Ann. Mm -hmm. Um, so... He probably came into existence um, around the time that the boy became conscious mm -hmm. of the world around him and started to have his own fears, uh, joys, doubts, and, you know, his emotions. Huh. So I think that's what informs that particular monster under the bed, which means the kid's going to grow up to be pretty fucking cool. <laughs> and I remember that closet monster. That was legitimately scary as a young child. Just the yes. slithering tentacle that come man, that was creepy. So that was designed by a guy named Jim Woodring, who everybody here should also look up. Brilliant artist. Um, he has a series of comic books. His work has been in the Louvre. Um, he he has a book with a forward by Francis Ford Coppola. I mean, all the things, right? Um, and uh, once again, I'm sidetracking, but sorry, I'm going to keep doing that a little bit less. Um, he had a comic book called Jim, and I wrote him a fan letter when I worked at Gumby, and uh, he reached out back out to me, a friendship that will last forever. And one of the things he did was um, help design some of the major characters for Bump in the Night, some of the major mm -hmm. minor characters. Mm -hmm. uh, David and I did the main main characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... I keep going back to that thing that you said about how Mr. Bumpy came into existence when the boy, when the boy went from like two year old to actually sentient seven year old human being, that's when he came up. That's a really interesting concept to think of that. He manifested this into a physical being, all his hopes and fears. Yeah. And you know, that that's, I, like I said, I just came up with it, but that's my story from now on. I really like that story. <laughs> So, um, all right. So I, you have mentioned before, Bump of the Night season three was recorded. It was shot. It was filmed. It was in the can, and then it got closed. Oh wait, did I get a ra? Did I get the O N? I got the W R already. Did I get the O N? Yeah, on you, this you, one? you got you got an O. Okay. Um, we had not. We it was completely recorded, completely boarded, and partly into production. Um, there were shows that were boarded and recorded that um, we hadn't even started building any new props or sets for. But uh, we had built, we had spent a lot of money on the third season already. Um, and, you know, we were shooting. There, There is film in the can somewhere, if there is still a can with film in it, um, that, uh, that has some of that third season stuff on it. And then, um, like I said, uh, Planet Disney... Uh, uh, or Asteroid Disney hit Planet Bumpy, and that was the end of that. What was the um, what were some of the episodes for season three, if you remember? I'm trying to think, I think I actually have a prop from that. Um, it was either a prop that was left over that was left over from um. No, no, this is a prop from third season. And I, I'm so glad I have it. It is, it is actually my last remaining bump in the night piece of um, 
of stuff that was on the show, like puppets and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we gave away tons of it. And um, last year, I, I basically bought a car um, from stuff I sold to a collector over one weekend. Wow. Um, he oh. just got in touch with me out of the blue and said, I collect this stuff. Um, are you selling it? So anyway, um, this was, this is a food duplicate of <laughs> Squishy. When um, Bumpy and Squishy are being chased by all of their enemies at once. It was going to be this insane two-parter. Um, oh, wow, that's cool. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, it, never, it never got made. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off, uh, off script again, just to tell you one thing I remember from that season is when we were writing that very episode, I wrote a joke that uh, I thought was really funny. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also said to David, oh, shit, I just wrote a joke that's super funny, but they're going to cut it, so I'm not even going to put it in the script. And he said, write the fucking joke. That's your job. Taking it out of the script is Mary's job. And I, I thought, oh, God, of course you're right. Mm -hmm. so in it went, and then out it came. <laughs> that's funny. So, wow, that... Man, it must, I mean, you, you obviously, I'm assuming you got paid for the season three, all the stuff you wrote and all the everything, but man, that just must be such a, such a crummy feeling to put all that work in it. And you're like, all you have to do is literally just put it on TV and let it do the rest. Cause I mean, I don't know how the ratings were at the time for bump of the night, but I'm assuming they were good enough to continue for a third season. If they had, yeah, a yeah, second exactly. Season. Exactly. Um, but, uh, that wasn't in, in Disney's plan and they owned it. Um, yeah, Mr. Pumpy. Oh, you know what's funny is there was an episode we did in first season called The Squishy Princess, mm -hmm. um, where Squishy dresses up like a princess. Squishy is officially a Disney princess. <laughs> yeah, where's she on the... Where, where's the Princess Squishy at the Disney parks? I want yeah. to get a picture with Princess Squishy. I think somebody also did the math that uh, the alien uh, hive mother is a, is a Disney princess because of some the way the ownership runs now. So it's Cinderella, Snow White, Alien Hive Princess. And uh, Squishy. <laughs> so I, you know, I want to ask you too about this because I was looking through your IMDb. I actually did a video on um, the Frog and Toad animated series. Oh, yeah. And you wrote an episode of Frog and Toad. I did. And yep. uh, within the last couple of years, you have been doing a lot of... Um, uh, younger, younger child shows, which I can't imagine. And again, I'm going to just list a couple of your credits. <laughs> Gumby Adventures, classic, one of the all-time classic American IPs. Bump in the Night, your creation. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog, Kong, King of the Apes, Woody Woodpecker, Mad World. And then you go to one of the most wholesome children's properties I've ever read in my life. How do you mentally make that make that jump and is it one of those things where they contact you specifically or did you see your agent get in touch saying i need a writing job and this is what's available yes both um you know i continue to network and um get jobs that way my agent will pull stuff out of the blue um i can't even remember how i got some of those jobs um i yeah i mean i worked on arthur and todd world and some of the, the newest stuff that's on Netflix, um, the, whose names I can't remember, the one with the train and the one with the little girl with the superpowers and all that stuff. Um, I can write anything. I mean, that's, that's my bottom line. Um, on, um, on my uh, LinkedIn, I think I call myself a word janitor. Um, you want your, your, show, your entire show to be haikus? I would love to do that. Um, limericks, even, even better. Um, songs, you got me. Um, and age, sure. Um, I can, I enjoy writing at more of the bump in the night, Woody Woodpecker, fast gags, running around, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and children's action adventure, adventure like Slug Terra or some of the other things I've written, mm -hmm. but I can easily put my head in the, in the kid's space. And, um, even there, I am probably the, I write the edgiest kids script you know my my gags are are a little bit 
different than most other people's gags. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're still kind of paying to get me. Mm -hmm. um, just a kinder, gentler me. <laughs> it, and it's funny because that Frog and Toad, um, directed by Sarah Johnson, who had worked on The Loud House, um, man, that Frog and Toad, I was so impressed by how well they were able to translate those you know, 10-page stories into 20, 30, 15-minute shorts. Well, you know, that was the reason that I got, um, I think it's called Down the Hill, mm -hmm. is um, uh, there's a, um, a story editor that I worked with a lot named Rob Hoagie. Um, he, Slug Terror was one of the shows I worked with him on, um, uh, a bunch of shows. And um, he was one of the people that was involved with Frog and Toad. So he knew me, he knew what I could do. And um, I said, uh, boy, there's not a lot going on in this one. <laughs> and uh, I was told, yeah, that's why you got this one. Because you, we know that you can just take one little moment of even walking through a door and turn it into, you know, five gags. And that's what I had to do. Um, so I added lots of layers. I mean, literally, the reason that, that Toad can walk through the door is that Frog put lots of layers on him. Um, and he was so covered with parkas and stuff, he couldn't go through the door. But I put lots of layers in every gag mm -hmm. uh, that I could think of, every moment from the very short story that was in the book, and thought, okay, how can I extrapolate th that on that? I tried not to change any of the, of the original material or add things that didn't happen, mm -hmm. because you can see that that show has enormous respect for the original material. Yeah. And yeah. that was, and um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the original author's name, but his kids were very involved. And they said they had received offers um, to do movies, but that the movie was going to be 3D animated and it was going to have adventures across the country and explosions and, you know, and, and mm. <laughs> I was so impressed by how this series got it right. I mean, that's a that's a tough one to do, too, because this is for kids, but it's also one of those... I don't know if you um, if you saw the Peanuts movie that came out in about 2012, 2013. Um, the, uh, it was uh, written by Schultz's kids, uh, by ah, his son. And, there uh, you go, well. It, yeah, and it was, re it was really great, though, and I was very impressed by it, but it's these, um, these kind of shows and movies that aren't greenlit that much anymore, where they're just sort of slice of life where now there has to be something very action-oriented. But you can do like you did, down the hill. You can have something be slow, but expound on, like, just walking through the door. That that shouldn't be something that maybe is funny, but you find a way to do it by just overloading him with... And it's it's just a great way to... It's a lost art, almost. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love doing it. Um, everything I see is a bit. Where's the bit on this? Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact... Here's another story. Um, I was in Vegas for a bachelor party for uh, one of the writers, one of the uh, showrunners on Friends, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm with a, I'm with these high level comedy writers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're having breakfast the next day, and I said, "Pass the salt," and they literally tabled the salt and started doing gags about passing the salt. And after a while, I said, "This shit's really funny," but. I really need the fucking salt before my eggs get cold. Um, and that's how comedy writers think. Mm -hmm. Everything is a possibility for a gag. Unhappy Tree Friends, after a while, everything is a possibility for an injury. <laughs> yeah, and that's... Uh, it's, it's just so funny you say that because a lot of the... I mean, for me personally, a lot of the funniest things are if your story's going to be about, we're going to go drive to the beach. Well... Yeah, there's going to be a lot of funny stuff at the beach, but the funniest part is getting ready to go to the beach. I mean, for anybody who's ever had to go with partners or family members or kids or anything, the the beach is the relaxing part once you get there after, of course, you find your spot. But getting everything into the car, getting on time, getting in traffic, it's just before the beach is where a lot of the real humor's at. But a lot of people only see it at the beach. Then, you know, the sand's going to be hot. But you miss. It's like, yeah. 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 It would be an interesting exercise to um, to write a script about a five second event. Yeah, and there was um, there was a uh, I'm forgetting the name, but the author he says that um, people don't think they have stories, but it's because they don't know they have stories. I mean, if you if you write down something that gives you an emotion every day 
for yeah. a year, you're going to have 365 stories, no matter how big or small it is. Yeah. What was the, what was my conflict today? Oh, that asshole who who was who was making a left turn uh, out of the wrong lane, and you know, then I got late for my doctor's appointment. And because of that, I have fucking cancer. Um, <laughs> I, like, I like how you go, because of that. i got to find that guy who made me late and blame him for my cancer. Well, right now, and I'm getting way off, but um, I work at a place called Audistry. Mm -hmm. And that's a place to look up, too. It's a um, vocational um, makerspace for autistic teens and adults. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my day job, uh, four days a week. And one of the things we're doing is we're doing a thing called uh, Story uh, Experimentive, I think, uh, with Pixar. It's a Pixar program, and they have a whole curriculum, and it's based on the concept of what if. Mm -hmm. um, and then what if this happened? Uh, I'm doing one right now as an example for the kids. What if a uh, staple, stapler fell in love with a staple remover? Um, and then you go, okay, what if, what if that happened? Then what would happen next? What would happen next? And that's what we were just talking about. Every moment is what if. Every, every story begins with what if. What if some asshole uh, blocked the turn lane and I was in a hurry? Mm -hmm. uh, and then off you go. Yeah. So anything can be a story. Yeah, and it's just it's the buildup and tension. Of course, like the inciting moment is the thing that gets all the attention, but it's everything that builds up to it. That's what's fun to see going through mm -hmm. that. I mean, you could have something like Mr. Bumpy. He... You know, he ends up eating himself, which is hilarious. But how does he get there? Well, he eats so much gum, and then he wants to eat the gum. Like, that's – people miss the small things that lead up to it, and that's where a lot of the funniest parts are. Mm -hmm. A lot of the funniest parts never even get written because you've done so much history and backstory in your character. You know how he was born, although I just figured that out today. Um, but, uh, you know, I know stuff about Mr. Bumpy that will never be on screen. But – the fact that I know it is reflected on screen in the choices he makes and things that happen. He was asleep once in, um, uh, he was in the one with the Turbo Totoro, mm -hmm. made in Japan. And Squishy comes rushing into Mr. Bumpy's bedroom after seeing the, this horrible monster. And Mr. Bumpy's asleep. And before he wakes him up, uh, and I don't know how we got this past the censor, um, and I believe it was an ad lib that Jim Cummings did, Mr. Bumpy goes, but... Mama, I don't want to wear the red dress. <laughs> and that's all you ever hear about that. I could write a feature about Mr. Bumpy and the red dress. <laughs> well, now I have to ask because for somebody who knows all things Mr. Bumpy, I mean, there's kind of one question that's been on everybody's mind since 1994. So, Mr. Bumpy, boxers or briefs? <laughs> he, um, he's porky pig in it. He's porky picking it. He's shirt cocking it. You know what I do like too that you don't see very often because you always see the front or the side. I love his black. Is it black hair or black spikes on his back? Yes and yes. Excellent answer. <laughs> so, all right, here's what um, we have. This it's a uh, five questions. So basically, what this is is it's the five questions, the easiest questions. It's the five easiest questions you'll ever answer. Okay. And then it's intersected by the five hardest questions you'll ever answer. Oh, my. Okay. So the first one, um, what is a professional or fan comment that has stuck with you? Uh, you've inspired me. That's a really nice one. Was there anybody in particular who, um, who that hit hardest from? I get it so much. Um, and I would say... You Were My Childhood is like another one on that same level. Um, I get that so much that it's, I couldn't tell you who said it. That's really nice. And then you find out that they're the person who stole your identity. <laughs> okay. I do have a story about that. Remind me later and I'll tell you if, if we remember and there's time. Yes. I'm going to, about your identity being stolen? Uh, no, no. About um, you inspired me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. Um, I do have I do have a favorite. I do remember the person and the instance. You can tell it now, unless it's an off air. Uh, no, no, no. Um, I've mentioned Slug Terra a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I was writing a two parter, and I was writing part one. And the writer who uh, was writing part two said to me, "I have to tell you, you're the reason I'm in this business. When I was a kid, I saw that Mighty Max adventure, 
uh, about the dragon with the wizard who kills himself. See, everything <laughs> is just a big Venn diagram. And it made me decide that's what I wanted to do. I love, how, the guy. I love how you're you writing about some guy killing himself. Some guy's like, you inspired me. That was the um, moment. <laughs> that I would hate to have that on a suicide note. <laughs> I watch Happy Tree Friends, and that's why I put the toaster in the bathtub. (laughs) Hey, well, you can tell your mom, Mom, that moment inspired me. Yes. All right, so good one. That that was a really nice one. I wasn't expecting that. uh, That's that's the frog and toad in you coming out, I think. Yeah. All right, so one hard question. Um, What is an aspect of your writing that you'd like to improve upon? I would like to write... uh better from a point of view I'm not familiar with. Um, in, um, in the comic book uh, I, worked, I wrote, um, Wacky Raceland, there was a transgender character. And um, I have a lot of friends in that community, mm-hmm. and I uh, had them keep me honest. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple of times that I was extremely dishonest that mm-hmm. they schooled me on. So, um, yeah, I'd like to be able to write better outside my own experience as a um, as an old white guy in, you know, in America. When you say that, though, like from the transgender point of view, were you finding that your problems were like, was it the dialogue or was it the backstory that you were giving that you found that you were having problems with there? Uh, dialogue in particular. There were a couple of terms I, I threw out that were like, no, you you never say that. Um, there were some that they said, oh, that that's that's good. Yep. Um, and just, they wouldn't talk that way mm-hmm. about that thing. So it wasn't necessarily the characterization. Like if you said, you know, whatever character it was that was transgender, they didn't have a problem with you writing for the transgender character, but they just were trying to make it like if you had written something, they said, well, it'd be a little more authentic if you went this way with it or if you yeah, use this exactly. terminology. Um, another, okay. I'm, I'm working on a show right now. Uh, it's actually going to go to kid screen uh, and debut there as you know the pitch, and um, it's about a little South American girl who gets powers. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I am neither little South American or a girl, um, and, and the very first hire that I'm going to have, if I have to, put, if we sell it and I put together a writing team, I'm going to get some uh, Hispanic women on there, mm-hmm. right the fuck away, to keep me honest. Yeah, all little ones, too. All little ones. They're going to be little girls. Um, a bunch of little, you know, actually running this stuff past kids is always good because they're, they're as honest as, as can be. Not in focus groups. Focus groups are fucked because the opinion you get from the alpha child becomes the opinion of all the children. <laughs> I like, but, can you please make that a show, the alpha child? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, I I would be killing him every time, him or her every time. Um, but yeah, uh, so that w- that's the area of writing I would like to be uh, better at. Can we take just a very short break, please? All right, I will be right back. Yeah, of course. Meanwhile, here's my dog. Oh, we were. Um, I was just having uh, people chime in with comments. I want to read another one for you, if that's please. okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Marcus Blackwell wants to know, um, that, uh, Mr. Bumpy season three, two parter, was that meant to be the finale? Uh, I can't remember. Um, honestly, yeah, I can't remember. I think not. There was, man, there was one where he dies, I think. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, it had, you know, it was like him in hell basically with yeah i'm not sure um either that or the one where he dies um <laughs> by the way is marcus the only person out there or, or is there a second marcus or no we marcus? marcus is the only one asking questions we have people um coming in and out we've had a few and then we have um we have a really big um people who watch after because yeah. a lot of these are younger kids i believe yeah. and um but yeah so um, all right, so easy question. All right. Um, who is somebody that you worked with that impressed you? Wow. Maybe that should have gone in the hard section. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, there's just so many. Um, I would say... Uh, Present company excluded. What's that? Present company excluded. Present company excluded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
two of my childhood heroes um, who worked on Marvel Comics forever. One of them literally created Wolverine, um, uh, Len Wein, uh, and Marv Wolfman. Um, and they were, they were kids who hung around you know, the, the comics industry until they became professionals. Um, and I worked with them on uh, a show called War Planets, um, mm -hmm. an early CG show. And I, I think I've worked with, um, with Len on some other shows. And this is an instance where my childhood heroes mm -hmm. become um, my coworkers and, some, uh, my, and my peers uh, and occasionally my friends. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's uh, that's really cool. I love that. All right, here we go. This one's gonna be, you know, we were talking a little bit about ego, so here's one of the hard ones. Yeah. Um, what is a time in your position as a writer or as a showrunner or producer, or director, um, what was a time you threw your weight around? Like, hey, I'm Ken Pontac. You know, I need this sushi and I need it raw. Wow, I don't know if I've ever done that. I'm going to ask my nurse, have, I, have you ever seen me do that in public ever? <laughs> uh, that's not exactly the same thing. Um, uh, no, not really. I, I will tell you. But you told when we were with. Wait a second. <laughs> In Portland, you were working on Gary and Mike, and we were going to a restaurant with Will Vinton, who was alive at his time. Can you hear this? A little bit. And, you know, Will Vinton was like the king of Portland uh, back in the day. <laughs> and his wife was saying, Will was saying, oh, this restaurant's kind of fancy, and I'm not sure, you know, we don't have a reservation. And I said, you're Will Vinton. Your your pictures at the airport. And his <laughs> wife is like, yeah, I think they'll let you get in. So that's really it's yeah. Not, it's not Ken. Second hand, second hand ego. Um, I will say that the greatest calling card of my life, hands down, mm -hmm. is Happy Tree Friends. Mm -hmm. um, that has opened all sorts of doors, um, and it's one of those ones where you either know it or you don't. And mm -hmm. if you know it, people like. Their, their their entire demeanor changes in one second. Whoa! You worked on Happy Tree Friends, and that has helped me in the industry. It's helped me in the world. Um, so I would never honestly say, "Hey, I'm Ken Pontac." Blah blah blah. <laughs> I don't do that shit. I just don't. Kill me if I do. But um, <laughs> I will certainly use the things that I have done um, to forward my own aims. I mean, that's that's legit. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's your resume. You you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But Everybody. no, I just, I'm just not that asshole. That's what I call producer jokes. A producer joke is any joke that deals with, yeah, we're not paying you this week. Ha ha, you're fired. Um, you know, <laughs> negative shit where they, they are showing that they're above you and they could do this stuff, but I'm just kidding. We're all friends here. And I will not. Anytime I even get close to doing anything like that, um, David, if he's around, will say, that's almost a producer joke. And I'll oh. shut the fuck up. <laughs> well, kids are watching this, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, we'll just bleep out the uh, entire two oh, hours. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, bleep me. By the I'm way, gonna... what a what a good wife though. When I ask, when's the time you threw your weight around? You're like, oh, boy, I don't know, honey. Do you have anything? And then she says the time somebody else threw their weight around. <laughs> that is a good partner right there. That's a great life partner to have. And she can resuscitate me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, which with all your enemies, it seems like a very valuable asset. Thank you. So, all right. You kind of answered this one earlier, but without looking at the cheat sheet, is there, um, what is one of the most, maybe not, just one of the most, more unusual um, production notes you've gotten? Uh -huh. um, well, yeah, that list has got a lot of them. Oh, okay, here's one. Jim Woodring and I were um, pitching a show uh, based on one of his characters named, um, oh, what was it? It, um, do you remember what it was called? Bronco Teddy. Bronco Teddy, who was a cowboy frog in a cowboy world, but nothing <laughs> that Jim does is typical. It was a weird cowboy world. Mm -hmm. And so some executive sees it and says, we love this show. This is great, but can you make him an astronaut? <laughs> you want to make the cowboy an astronaut? Is the frog still a frog? Who fuck? Well, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not. Probably not. Um, 
it's probably a monkey. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Yeah, that was that was a good one, a weird one, and sadly typical. That's really funny. Also, we're gonna make it live action, and you two won't be involved. Right. <laughs> That's so <laughs> That's funny. The idea. You know, we couldn't even sue him for stealing our idea because it wasn't anymore. Gosh, it it never seems to work out that way. It, it's you, your original incarnation of the show. And sometimes, like, there is something to be said about working within, like, your creative working within a boundary. I think that my two favorite things creatively are complete opposites. Like, there's that old adage where you have wacky characters in a normal world or a normal uh, a normal character in a wacky world. Like, I love that. I love complete opposites. But then I do also like sometimes when you are given creative limits because then it sort of stretches that creativity on your part. Absolutely. Anytime we would get a, a note from uh, the censor at Bump in the Night, we would come up with a better joke. We yeah. felt it was our duty to come up with time. Duty. I said duty. Um, <laughs> We're going to bleep that. A better joke. And we we would every time. That's awesome. I, I love that. Yeah, it's it's... Sometimes, sometimes the first no is the second one. The second one's always better, it seems like. I said sometimes always better. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> all right, so here's one. What is, um, if you have ever, and if you remember what it was about, have you ever gotten into, in a writer's room, in a producer meeting, in a pitch meeting, have you ever gotten into a verbal argument with somebody that you were working with or supposed to be working with? <laughs> oh, have I ever? Um, Sonic. Uh, and I don't even remember what this quibble was, but Warren and I were there for a week um, with uh, with the director and uh, his crew on one side of the table and me and Warren and our producer on the other side. And there was something that he wanted to be done. Like I said, I can't even remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the thing, too. Almost every argument you ever have is about some trivial stuff that doesn't matter. Um, there's only a couple of things that matter. And those are life and death and friends and, you know, that kind of stuff. But this, this argument really mattered then. Um, and it was the last day, uh, the end of the last day before we were going to, you know, get on the plane the next morning and this is our last meeting and the director needed to go to a quote, he's going to a drinking party. Um, <laughs> and um, he, he asked me one last time, um, so are you going to put in this thing that I've been asking you to put in? And I said... I'll put it in, but you're wrong. And that this is in Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan is very formal. Um, his entire crew gasped and took a step backwards. He got an expression on his face like a puppy that had just been spanked. Um, I think at that point I felt a little good about it because it, it, they had been some brutal meetings. Uh -huh. Now I, I feel kind of, you know, I'm not proud of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's worth telling the story. Um, so, yeah, I would say that one. Yeah, and that's tough because especially – it's hard in the moment, especially when you're heated. And it's funny that you say that. Like your wife, she's a nurse, and she's like, man, honey, I just I – had, I had to deliver a baby and somebody's heart attack. And you go, like, trust me, Sonic's quills were a little too long. I know exactly how you feel and things getting stressful at work. But it's, it's so hard to – when that's your job, and it's so hard to just maintain that composure when somebody is constantly prodding you. Uh -huh. Um. We could do a whole show about Gumby. Art <laughs> Clayton and I were pretty... We fucking hated each other. Why, why, why even... You can bleep that out. <laughs> but what, why say anything but the truth? <laughs> and that started early on and went through the entire season until he fired me um, before the last episode to be filmed, which was the first one that was written because he asked me to write it to help sell the show. Um, and you can kind of see how that, you can kind of see the core of the problem right there. Yeah. And, um, it was Gumby Adventures and that was the first, um, episode you were paid to write, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Gum that was the first professional script I ever wrote. So yeah. at that point, I mean, there's, I mean, Gumby, obviously this legendary property when you, how did you get the call or how did you get the opportunity to write for that? Cause I remember you said that you had made a fan or not a fan, but you had made a short film. Okay. Um, are we done with the questions? Oh, we can, okay. we can go through the rest. I mean, Oh no, I'll tell you the story if you want. Um, I'm not sure how you are for time. You oh, I like, shoot. I got until, uh, what's today? Uh, Saturday. Yeah. I got until yeah. like Tuesday. 
So we're good. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Yeah, because you, you'll probably edit this, right? Um, so this is how I met Art. And once again, I, I told this story uh, about Happy Tree Friends and other things. Um, so uh, there was a movie called Eraserhead. Mm -hmm. Very strange movie. Midnight show um, at, at uh, you know, all the art theaters. So I was watching it with a guy named Kevin Mack, who was my roommate at the time. Look him up. He, he basically was the effects director for half of the movies that you saw in your childhood. Um, and uh, also David. The three of us were watching this. We decided we'd make a, a clay animated short. So we did. Um, we showed it to any, everybody that we possibly could. Showed it to a woman uh, who, who rented movies. Remember, this is in the 80s. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were, I don't even know if there were VCRs. Um, so it was, it was a 16 millimeter print that we were carrying around with us to show anybody with a projector in a dark room. Um, this woman at a film rental place took a look at it. She said, you should contact my friend, uh, or not my friend, but one of my uh, clients, Art Clokey. I carry some of his um, abstract art films. Um, we knew who Clokey was, called him up. Um, one thing led to another, and um, David became the line producer of Gumby, and I became the art director. Um, once again, reaching out, jumping through that window, um, taking the risk that somebody might say no. And that really started my career. Yeah, and when you first um, were writing that script, I mean, were you were you excited or nervous? I'm sure you were both, but what was the feeling like, oh man, because I know a lot of people, they get imposter syndrome. When, when you say, yeah, I can do this, I can do this, and then once you're tasked with it, you go, what am I doing? I, I've never written a script before. I've never done anything like this. Um, at that moment, no, I was, I was just excited. Um, I was working at a, a FX call house called, um, Robert Abel and Associates. Um, they did effects for the first Star Trek movie and a million things. They were, they were one of the biggies back in the day. Um, and I left, uh, that was in Southern California. I left to do Gumby and we were going to do, um, 99 episodes in, I think a year and a half you know, hours and hours and hours of content. Um, and they were all going, uh, oh, nobody can do that. You can't do that. And my favorite fortune cookie says, man who says it can't be done should get out of the way of the man doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And that is generally my attitude. Every once in a while, I definitely just comes out of nowhere. It's, I get imposter syndrome and go, I can't believe that I did this thing and they paid me. Don't they realize that <laughs> I'm tricking them? Um, I rarely think that, the, that what I wrote stinks, but just like, okay, this is kind of it. When David and I um, walked into the 35 square foot empty warehouse, it was going to come bump in the night studios, um, or Danger Productions actually is our, co our company name. In this giant cavernous echoey space, he looks at me and he says, I feel like I'm 10 years old. <laughs> I said, me too. That's and awesome. Was, that was not just the excitement and possibility, but the, oh my God, they, they're giving us all this money to do this. What if we blow it? <laughs> yeah, it was everything. That's super cool. I love, ah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, all right, I got a couple more questions here. And uh, we have another question uh, from the audience. Uh, Marcus, hey. <laughs> how do you know? Oh my gosh, you guys know each other. Um, is that your wife's name? Is she watching? Uh, let's take a look here. Um, did Gumby Adventures 1988 have professional voice actors or just voices from the original? Uh, well, the voices from the original, uh, some of them were professional voice actors. It was um, Dallas. Oh, God, I forget his last name. Guy named Dallas, big Santa Claus beard, literally a twinkle in his eye. Um, he did Gumby's voice and some of the supporting voices. The rest of it was basically the Cloakey family and a couple of, um, of staff members. Um, Art did Prickle um, and uh, Pokey. Um, Gloria did Goo and some other characters. And um, that's why the, the acting is so terrible in it. <laughs> that's funny. I like that. <laughs> All right. Um, easy question. Here we go. Um, what is a cartoon? throughout your entire, as a viewer, through your entire life, that always makes you laugh, or that always puts a smile on your face? Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Um, 
I should have switched these because the ones about you battling the industry, those are the easy ones for you. And then the ones that are supposed to be sentimental, you're the one that's struggling with them. It's funny. Well, I mean, those are, those are hard questions. Um, Grandma, I drew a picture, and, and my brother Bobby drew a picture. Which one do you like? The- <laughs> um, it's, it's tough because there's so many that I love and laugh at. It would probably be some old Tex Avery screwball comic, you know, with, or cartoon with, with screwy squirrel in it. Yeah. Or, um, you know, an old – what's that? Uh, Rick and Morty. Yeah, that, that gets some laughs out of me. I mean, that wasn't- well, Bojack is not laugh out loud funny. Bojack is brilliant, and I could I could watch that multiple times and see new things. But I think the question was laugh at, right? Yeah, or just a favorite cartoon of yours that you could watch forever. If there's one I'll cartoon, watch forever. God, that's. I mean, honestly, that is so hard. Um, if I had to watch it forever, it would have to be something that had a lot of detail in it, <laughs> and I'd be in hell. Be, <laughs> you have to watch this forever until it's not funny. Um, I, I mean, I crack up at a lot of Happy Tree Friends stuff because mm-hmm. uh, I, f- I forget I forget episodes. Um, I know not not the best answer, but it's the most honest answer. No, Just, that's great. We got we asked one question and got four answers. I'll take that any day. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, here's one. This isn't the hard section, but we're going to call this the easy section now. Um, okay. <laughs> one professional decision you've made that you would change. Um, boy, that is hard. Um, I'll just say hiring that guy that everybody hated so much that we originally, or that we ultimately did fire him. Wow. What's, was it for as much as I can say, (laughs) was it, uh, I won't say for anything, but was it just for conduct or was it for creative differences or just this guy was the kind of guy, you know how you, your monkey brain just smells stuff. Sometimes you just, (laughs) That person just seems wrong to me. Uh-huh. I don't even know why I don't like him. This guy could walk into the room and go, hey, buddy, I just want to give you this $20 bill. And you would say, oh, get the hell out of my face. <laughs> get away from me. Um, that's just chemically annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, that's not my fault or his fault. That's just the way, well, the way, he, the way he was. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a his fault. <laughs> that's his fault. <laughs> um, a professional uh, decision and then there was another one um, there was an animator um, named Pete Kleinow and he was one of the original Gumby animators uh, he was in a band called the Flying Burrito Brothers he wrote the oh yeah mm-hmm. um, he did the initial uh, animation on um, Terminator mm-hmm. and um, by the time that he was working on he was working on Gary and Mike and I was one of the directors and um he just had kind of lost, he'd lost his abilities. Um, and it became apparent um, as his shot quota got less and less. And we finally did have to let him go, you know, fire him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did not make myself available for him to talk to. I let a producer do that. Mm. Uh, and I didn't fire him face to face or at least be in the room. Mm-hmm. And I have always felt crummy about that. So I would say that one. Did you um, ever cool. Did you ever reach out after or bump into him and explain uh, or apologize? I bumped into him, but at that point he had Alzheimer's. Um, and oh. so my um, my and he probably had it during the show too because that that when I found out that he had been diagnosed with that, that answered a lot of questions. Um, oh. So any apologies uh, fell on deaf ears. All right, comedy, folks. Uh, <laughs> that's that's what we're going to lead the interview with. I'm just going to put that clip. <laughs> yeah, right. Are you ready for the funniest man in animation? He had uh-huh. Alzheimer's, and uh, any apologies went unnoticed. Weren't. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do one hard question. I'm going to end it with an easy question for you. So a time you almost quit or were so frustrated you wanted to walk away from the industry entirely. Gumby. Wow. Uh, Almost quit, not walk away from the industry. As I said, there was a great deal of enmity between Art and myself. As a matter of fact, when one of the the lowest, we would call them mud rolling droids, um, their main job was literally to just take the hard blocks of Van Aken clay mm-hmm. and knead it all day into pliable balls, which took some time. 
Pliable Balls, by the way, was my band name in college, uh, when the lowest mud rolling droid would walk up to me after a very public altercation and go, boy, you and Art really hate each other. <laughs> I mean, it's like Superman and Lex Luthor. It's like you've hated each other in previous lives. And I quote, um, so one of those times I got in my car and just drove north. I just fucking drove north. I was going to drive all the way to Canada and just to chill out. Man. And um, I, I'm not sure if there were cell phones or not back then. But at some point, I was contacted by uh, Kevin Rear, who worked in the office at the time uh, and is now a big guy at Pixar. Um, and he kind of talked me off the ledge. And I came back, and I think Art apologized a little bit, you know, crocodile tears, and <laughs> we were civil for a while until the next blowout. Um, so, yeah, that almost made me leave the industry. Wow. Or at least that job. I can't, I can't wait to hopefully you come back, and we can just spend the whole two hours going through your Gumby adventures, because I have this picture up here, Gumby adventures with Gumby and Pokey smiling, and... <laughs> there's just people have no idea apparently the fists that were the verbal fists that were flying and it sounds like almost real fists that were flying if you want a glimpse into the darker side of art Tim Hiddle uh, the great animator I was talking about uh, did a documentary um, with Art's blessing a lot of his interviews with Art called uh, Gumby Dharma hmm. and it's a really good uh really good documentary and art talks as openly about himself as I ever heard him talk. And, um, he even admits to doing some of the shitty things that he actually did. Did that, uh, give you a different perspective on your time with him or no, no, I knew all that shit. Nobody else did. Um, so the perspective I gave was, Oh, at least now some people have a slight idea of why I couldn't stand the guy. <laughs> now you can just point and say, see, I told you, I told you. Well, some of it. I mean, the deeper, the deeper stuff. Yeah, I, I would happily do an, uh, another. I would do a Gumby one of these with you. Yeah, um, and then we'll go with an easy one because I also do want to get to the latest project that you're working on, Out of the Ashes. Um, that's definitely an important one we got to talk about. Yeah. Um, easy question. Someone that you found you could turn to during your hardest times. Uh, my wife Susan. Good answer. Uh, she's sitting right next to me. What else am I going to say? <laughs> Look, I'm pitching you softballs here. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get your weekend happy. I don't want you to <laughs> have to suffer. Was there a was there a project or a time that, you know, in your time working where it was really difficult and she either said something or that you guys took a trip somewhere? Was there just a an instance where you were like, "Man, I I could not have gotten through this without you?" Uh, what do you think, babe? I've been quite a few of those off and on over the years. Yeah, um it, she just has a, a voice of clarity. I mean, as, as a nurse, she has to talk to a lot of people in distress um, whose situation is not the best situation. And she knows how to put that into perspective, how to calm them. Um, and, you know, she is able to use those gifts on me. Uh, so that's, that's extremely helpful. Um, a lot of the times it was my, uh, my partner, David, um, you know, because we worked on a lot of stuff together and, um, you know, he also, he has a cooler perspective than me. Um, it, it was often said that, um, he was the Spock to my Kirk. Um, and, uh, I think that is, that's a good comparison. Uh, he was the squishy to my bumpy. Um, you know, it's, it's so, yeah, that would be, that would be another one. It was nice to go to a meeting in Hollywood. Um, and leave the room and know that there was at least one person who wouldn't be trying to stab me in the back or screw me over in that room. Um, and as a matter of fact, somebody once tried that uh, while I wasn't there. And he just started laughing at them, just started laughing and saying, there is absolutely no way you are going to have me go in that direction. And I'm going to tell Ken about this. Uh, and, and it's so funny because, I mean, obviously it's not the way it works, but you think that if we're pitching a show, we're doing a creative project, we all want it to succeed. Again, like we talked about earlier, like we want this to get off the ground. We want, and that's what they always say. Oh, Ken, we'd love to work with you. We love your work on, and then they look at a post-it note, you know, bras in the night. We love it. We love that old show you did. 
But then, you know, the second that they get you on it, it seems like everything changes all of a sudden. Look, Ken, we love Mr. Bumpy, but we think he should be an astronaut monkey. It's... I have I have a, a joke, if you want to hear this. Of course. Very well. So, a writer and a director and a network executive go to a restaurant, and they all buy the exact bowl of soup. I mean, not just one soup. They each order the chicken soup. And the writer goes, um, hmm, needs a little bit of salt. He pours some salt in it. Ah, now it's perfect. The director goes, oh, I think it needs some pepper. Grind some pepper into it. The executive goes, hmm, this soup is perfect. And then he takes his shit in it. <laughs> uh, somebody came up with the uh, addendum to that. And then everybody else had to eat the soup with the shit in it because the executive was paying for lunch. <laughs> yeah, had you, had you ever heard that one, babe? Yeah, one. Uh, I forget who came up with that. But yeah, I thought that was brilliant. And that's great. That is really funny. Um, man, you did it. So for the for the first person who actually did the five easiest question questionnaire, how was it? Was it a little easy or a little hard? Um, as you said, some of the easy ones were hard and the hard ones were easy. Um, the hardest ones were the pick your favorite. Um, because I, I, you know, that's, that's cheating. I'll be it a little bit. If I'm being honest, that's a little bit cheating, but Hey, I yeah. love, you know, there's no right answers, only wrong ones. So yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> uh, the other ones, no, I've, ex I've been doing this for so long. I've experienced most of the things yeah. so I can answer most of the questions and have a story behind it. At least one story behind it. And speaking of stories, man, how does he get so good at segues? Um, <laughs> So we have um, your latest project you're working on, Out from the Ashes, a family story yep. of survival during the Ukraine war. Um, if you don't mind, I just want to read the um, blurb that's on the website. By the way, I don't know if I can hear you right now. I, I don't know if your sound is off. Can you hear me? Yeah, I didn't know if you're pantomiming or just um, <laughs> if my sound oh, yeah, is I'm, off. I'm, I'm actually going to quit this business. I have had enough. I'm walking out. I'm going to be a mime. Um, Finally. I'm, I'm going to study everything that mime on Happy Tree Friends did and do that until it kills me. The only sound you'll hear is the sound of your wife leaving you with half your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the story out from the ashes, um, uh, sorry, a family story of survival during the Ukraine. Uh, Milena? Mal uh, Milena, yes. M Milena survived the destruction of Maripol, cowering for a month in the basement of a bombed out building, watching her home in history burn. With food running low, Milena was liberated by Russians and taken at gunpoint to a Russian-controlled refugee camp in the breakaway Donetsk Pub People's Republic. She managed to contact Ken Pontak, longtime Facebook friend and father figure. Here she slept on a filthy, freezing floor with her mother, grandmother, and 200 other kidnapped Ukrainians. After being rescued by a sympathetic Russian, Milana, uh, Milena, jeez, why can't I get that? I, I could pronounce all those Russian names except Milena, and family was released to a small apartment nearby but she was still a prisoner. With Ken's help and the heroic efforts of the international team he assembled, three generations of the family were extradited from their imprisonment, uh, furtively couch surfing. Furtively? I've never heard that word. Uh, I was an English minor. That's why I wasn't a major, because I missed that uh, one question. You only on the did test. that when you're a major. That's a grad school term. <laughs> furtively couch surfing through Russian safe houses until finally reaching what they believed was freedom in Estonia. A red tape nightmare forced with the family to return their war-torn war home, home, where they await the international documents that will help them find a life on, uh, on the other side of the world. If only they're not recaptured by Russian troops again. So, um, little backstory. When I was getting in contact with Ken, I asked him what he would like to promote. And he gave me this. And, wow, I got to say from the trailer. First of all, not what I was ex expecting. Right. <laughs> but it's about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a two and a half minute trailer and it is very powerful. It's very moving and it's very frightening that this is the kind of stuff where no matter how much writing experience you have, you just can't make up. And the fact that it's going on currently is even scarier. And I just want to kind of get a little backstory on this. So um, how did you meet uh, Milena? Um, first of all, can you, I want to make sure that they, um, that everybody here has a chance to watch the trailer. Um, so if you go to uh, www uh, um, out from the ashes one word out from the ashes dot film mm -hmm. not com not org dot film and the link will be in the description afterwards 
Oh, okay, great. Then I'm done with that part. Uh, <laughs> so the way I met Milena is I worked on a show called Lazy Town, where I wrote um, uh, a couple of scripts, um, and particularly a song called You Were a Pirate. Um, and uh, she was a fan of Lazy Town. And without going into too many details, a friend, Stephen Carl, the, um, who played Robbie Rotten, got sick, ultimately died. Um, she and I worked together on campaigns to raise money for him, and we became friends. Um, friendship lasted through the years and, um, and uh, up to and you know, beyond the uh, current war in Mariupol. Um, so I was in touch with her uh, as the war was building uh, to the point that she ended up in, this bo- in her basement. Uh, and then um, I lost contact with her for quite a while. And then I got a call at, um, or a text at like, you know, three in the morning, because I would check every day. I would check, you know, to see if she had put anything on WhatsApp. And all of a sudden there was something on WhatsApp. And it said, um, I'm alive, but captured by Russians. Take me off from here. And um, 40 years in the animation industry has clearly given me the tools to extricate people from Russian prisons um, because I managed to do so. I managed to get her out by putting together a team of people who did different things to help her and her family escape. Wow. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how you, I mean, how did you get in contact with these people who were, I mean, were you just were starting from square one or did you have a lead or did somebody recommend it? Uh, I'm a guy who knows a lot of guys. I'm a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. And I'm just a guy. I'm a guy who knows a guy. And if I don't know that guy, then the guy I know knows that guy. I'm basically three steps of separation from knowing the guy. And um, Great guy, by the way. Great guy. He's a great... <laughs> he knows everybody. Um, so basically, because of the huge network, you know, networking, it all comes back to that. Um, you know, reaching out to your heroes, reaching out to your friends, um, telling everybody I worked on Happy Tree Friends, um, opening doors, going through them. Um, People are the greatest currency in the world. Well, friends are the greatest currency in the world. That's something a human trafficker says, by the way. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, that's another. That's another job that I could talk. I could talk two hours about my human trafficking career. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I, anyway, um, so friends are the greatest currency you can have, and people are the greatest asset you can have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I have a lot of friends, and I know a lot of people. And also, um, I became very political um, when um, Trump entered the White House. And that changed a a big way that I perceived the world. And so I got a lot of friends in the political arena. Um, One of them had experience in um, helping refugees uh, out of Afghanistan come to the United States. So she had a whole Rolodex of people and the wherewithal to contact other people out of the blue. She contacted somebody out of the blue, and he actually was part of a a boots-on-the-ground organization in Ukraine who was flying supplies in and getting refugees out. Um, So that helped. She had a a friendly Russian friend um, who was a Happy Tree Friends fan, and he was instrumental in part of the first escape. there were, you know, other people had friends in Russia who helped her hide and couch surf to get to the next location. Um, so it's all about just keeping plates spinning and getting the plates together. Um, anybody could do it. <laughs> yeah, you make it sound so easy. It was not easy. It was, um, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Probably the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, It took a huge toll on me. Um, As my friend said, the uh, Afghanistan refugee friend, he said, I would only do this for you. I promised myself I would never do this again. Um, She was a friend. And um, it uh, it kind of broke me for a while. Uh, It took me a while to kind of get over that. And, um, you know, now, spoiler alert, uh, the family is safe in Mexico and... um, you know, I, I'm just happy about the way everything went. That's a great ending to that story because I was going to ask if, you know, we can know 
the um, the results of that, but I cannot wait to see how she gets from being captured to the beaches of Alcapulco. Like you, <laughs> there's not a lot of better places you could have asked to have gone to for uh, being a refugee. She's in Mexico City, but um, it's still you know it's a vibrant city. We went to interview her um, after a fundraiser was able to get us there, and uh, we had a great time for the over the week. She's um, she's starting an acting career. Um, right now she's doing extra work, but she's getting tons of work because nobody looks like a tall, beautiful Ukrainian woman. Um, and so they're putting her in fancy dresses and zombie makeup and all this stuff. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, Goose, if that is your real name, um, I will send you a watermarked link that has the entire feature on it that you can watch. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to watch it. I, um, yeah, I was, I was gonna, I mean... As I told you before, we um, um, I do make a donation for every guest that's on here, and I was going to do the one to get the digital um, the digital copy. So I'm still going to do that um, for Out of the Ashes. I still want to do that because, of course, it's a really important story to tell. Um, but yeah, I can't wait. I would love to check that out. And I'm I'm going to correct you. I hate correcting people, um, but the mistake you made this time is called Out from the Ashes. <laughs> out um, from. There are already too many things called Out of the Ashes. Um, you can't you can't uh, copyright a title. Um, before Bump in the Night, there were things called Bump in the Night. There was a poem about creepies and crawlies and long-legged beasties and things that go go, go bump in the night. Um, and from that old, you know, bedtime poem to scare children, um, there were you know that's what a great title. I'll use that for my mystery about this thing, and I'll I'll use this about that. And we decided we'd use it too. Yeah. Um, so that's why we didn't use Out of the Ashes. Because uh, we couldn't find any other things that said out from the ashes. Got it. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to keep you from the rest of your day. Um, but, man, this has been so... I mean, like I said, you've had... Uh, I don't want to say a hand in my childhood because I don't want any legal action to come from it. But, <laughs> no, you have... I mean, seriously, from the very first cartoon basically I ever watched to the most important franchise I've ever been a part of to... Things that are, I'm finding out that you were working on, like Wacky Race, and I had no idea that was you, and I always thought, man, what a cool, like, and for the time it was, 2016, it was kind of gritty and edgy, but not in the conventional way that you're seeing with The Dark Knight or those kind of, it, it was different. It was still that goofy Hanna-Barbera, but it was exciting. It was a new a new take on it. And, Thank you. And I know that you've gotten, as you said, um, some flack for um, just creative decisions or your writing, but... I, I I appreciate it so much because you know what's boring? The same character, 40 years, the same thing. I'll tell you uh, one last thing about all of that. I've always said, and this is why the Sonic fandom stuff, this is why nothing bothers me. Um, I would like to have maybe 85% of people love my stuff. 15% absolutely hate it. I would rather have that, or even more people hate it, even 50-50. I would go for 50 people loving my stuff and 50 people hating it over meh. Nothing is worse than meh. Oh, I, yeah. want a, I want a reaction. Otherwise, what you've done is not worth ha having done. Indifference is the most disappointing thing to a creator. Yes. And we do have one more question. This one's not from Marcus. I'm sorry. I know you and Marcus have gotten kind of close over the last... Marcus, <laughs> you broke my heart. This is from Joey Baseball, the true last name, I believe. Um, since always, see, so goes, I actually do have a question. Since I'm always interested in fast food, kids' meals, toys, how involved were you in the Subway Bumpy Toys? Ah, uh, what a great question. Because um, they got them right. We had so much merch that was off model. I could do a whole show about how the merchandising went wrong. They um, they were given drawings of the characters. Everybody got a style guide, mm -hmm. um, and the style guide is basically a thing that you give to um, anybody who's going to deal with the character once it leaves your hands. Um, merchandisers, um, people who are writing books, whatever, and it's pictures of the characters on model from every angle. A close-up of Mr. Bumpy's eyes saying, always put the little white reflection dot in there. Mm -hmm. You know, very, very specific details. And some people basically wipe their butts with them. And some people follow them very closely. And the subway people 
really got it right. Um, some of, sometimes we got to have input on the materials. I don't even know if we saw the subway materials before they came out. Uh, super happy with it and a great, great question. Um, I'd also like to just uh, add to um, how many people have asked questions? Uh, three, including me. Okay, I would like you to get the contact information for those two people. Um, mailing address preferable if uh, they have a safe, I don't know how little they are, if they have a safe place where they would like to get some swag. But they are oh. going to be rewarded for doing that. Marcus more than the other person. <laughs> Marcus was, is my man. Well, Joey just got out of first grade right now, so. What's that? Joey just got out of first grade today, so. Is that your kid? No, I'm just joking. That, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I, I'd love to know their age so I can be somewhat appropriate. Um, an address of where they um, they can send stuff and have them ask their actually have them ask their parents those questions. Um, say that you know I want to reward them for their participation, and um, if they think that that is uh, acceptable, to follow up with contacting me. Absolutely. Awesome. Guys, hear that? You're going to get a little bit of Ken Pontax swag, basically whatever he's cleaning out of his uh, storage unit that day. <laughs> but no, that's really cool. With that, I know I know they'll appreciate it. I mean, these two folks are people who always come to the streams um, because I think they're unemployed mostly, but also big fans of you and uh, for some reason, this channel, which I, I reviewed The Point from 1970, so I don't know who's watching that. Wow. You remember wow. that one? Yeah, geez, that, that is some old school reviewing you're doing. Let me ask you this then really quick. When you watch The Point, do you remember the narrator? Because there was an, uh, I want to say, Alan Thick, Ringo Starr. There was like three or four narrators, and I'm always interested to see who, um, which version you got. I know it's kind of a far back. No, um, I have to say that a lot of stuff that happened, when, when did that come out? That was, uh, I want to say, the late 1970s. Yeah, late 1970s to um, most of the 80s. A lot of that memory was eradicated, I'll just say, by my association with Hollywood. <laughs> That's so, a pretty good time to be out of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 1971, excuse me. Man, Oblio, yeah, that was a great one. I remember my dad um, introduced me to that. That was when you know he was a kid. And, uh, that was a really trippy one, but I love that schoolhouse rock art style. It's a very yeah. Americana style. It really is. That is, uh, it has little hint of European stuff in it, but it is, it is definitely uh, Americana style. A lot of the perspective in it, because you don't see buildings that are just straight up. You see them at an angle a lot of the time, and you see a lot of um, just the colorization and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it, but the point's a trip. I mean, I do, like I said, I do all stuff that's way far back, and I think some of them gets... You know, I had a Peanuts one get 40,000 views, which I'm like, cool. And I'm like, I got did the point, and that got four views. And I'm like, that makes sense, but it was still worth doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, well, I don't want to keep you any longer, but is there anything you'd like to say uh, to the folks before uh, we get you off here? Um, well, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting my work as much as you might have. And, um, oh, everybody should write a letter to, um, to Disney um, saying, bring back Bump in the Night. You hear that? Write your Disney congressman. Write um, your Disney congressman. And and really quick, Ken, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this shut down. But if I could just talk to you for a second after the uh, camera's sure. done rolling. All right, awesome, folks. That has been Ken Pontac. <laughs> Ken Pontac, everybody, uh, creator of Bump in the Night, right on Happy Tree Friends, and pretty much um, the architect of your young life. Uh, thank you guys for uh, joining us, and we'll see you next time.